Joe, welcome to the program. We got we got three fantastic individuals ready to in, in the in the works, ready to go. Of course, V, the grill economist, and a gentleman that I've been uh, really just slaughtering his name all week, Ken Shorgen. How's that for? Just I think flawless, you got it. Per, 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 flawless, Ken Shorgen. Of course, anyone who's read the Examiner, and and most of you have, he is the uh, editor of the Finance uh, Finance Examiner. Uh, and also, Mr. Andy Sutton, just a fantastic. Uh, you can't you can't get any better than this. If you go to yeah. homelandsecurityus.com, check on the uh, top story there. You can read their bios, bona fides, and there you have it. But Joe, yeah, great to be here, and we do have all three of our guests with us. And uh, I'm going to turn this over to V. V, it's good to have you back on the program. It's been a while. How are things going with you? Gentlemen, it's great to be back. Uh, I just want to say hello to you and uh, and Doug and Ken and Andy. Uh, I am fired up. I mean, I had a very busy holiday season with all the deadlines uh, and all the projects that I had to get done and all the forecasting that needs to be done for 2014. And I'm so privileged and I'm so looking forward and totally prayed up about tonight's broadcast, especially since... Uh, I have Ken and Andy on board. Uh, These guys are not only kindred spirits. These guys are my brothers. Uh, I'm so blessed to have them as members of the Rogue Money team, Uh, and they write for Rogue Money as well. And their insight is absolutely priceless. So tonight, folks, get ready, because you are about to experience the most hard-hitting three hours of economic information, the likes of which you have never seen. Uh, Earlier in the week, uh, me, Ken, and Andy, we got together on a conference call, and we decided what what we're going to do. And we've all come to the consensus that tonight we're going to shatter paradigms. Tonight we're going to open up eyes. And people always ask for what's the strategy, what's the solution. Well, we're going to give you the strategies, but most importantly, we're going to give you the only solution, and that is also the most blessed hope. Uh, with that, uh, I, I would just hand it over to, to Doug and uh, or, or Joe and, and if, or Ken and Andy. If you guys want to chime in, uh, feel free. I guess we could uh, kind of run this as a, as a forum, and I'll moderate if you want. You know what, V? And by the way, folks, uh, you're listening to V, the Gorilla Economist. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna put him in the center of the dais here, and and on his uh, left is gonna be Mr. Andy Sutton, and on his right is gonna be Mr. Ken Shorjan. And uh, uh, so, V, you go ahead and moderate. We're gonna just kind of take a back seat because you're the expert. You know what questions to ask. And, and folks, we're very privileged to have these three gentlemen with us. So please pay very close attention. Take some notes if you want to. Um, I would urge it, and uh, let your friends, social networking people, know uh, what's that the, the, this forum is taking place. So V, we're going to turn it over to you. You know what questions to ask. You know how to start it. Go for it, my friend. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that is preom- preeminent uh, in a lot of people who are uh, awake, uh, as well as those who are starting to get an inkling that something is definitely wrong with the system, is what's, what are we looking for, gentlemen, in 2014? What's coming down the pike? What should people be uh, afraid of? What they should be uh, uh, on the lookout for? So, uh, Andy, uh, I'll, I'll pick on you first. Uh, why don't you go ahead and, uh, and uh, uh, address that issue? And then well, first of all, I just up. want to say that it, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here, and I couldn't be more wound up. I was telling these guys through email just how wound up and excited I was to be here. 2014, I just finished today uh, my weekly article and tore apart uh, the IMF working paper that was released not too long ago. It was written by Carmen Reinhart and Ken Rogoff. And, you know, they're both Harvard economists. They both are associated with the IMF. And the IMF claims, well, this isn't really our official position, but you know what? It's on IMF letterhead. Their name's on it, so as far as I'm concerned, they're they're at least behind it. And these guys are coming right out. I mean, they don't even mince the words, V. They come right out and say, you know what? We need inflation. We need uh, captive audiences to lend their money and give their money to bail out 
basically governments, banks, whatever, hold on to your wallets in 2014. Cyprus was a beta test. Poland, mm. mainstream media didn't even touch it. They didn't want to talk about it. 50% haircut. And that's, that's you know what, I don't even like using their terminology. Let's just call it what it is. It's a robbery. 50% right. robbery in Poland. That stuff is going to continue. We've got Detroit brewing. Who knows how big the how big the robbery is going to be in Detroit. We have other municipalities. We've got L.A., Chicago, New York, <laughs> all these different places. It, it's brewing everywhere, and the mechanisms are in place. The FDIC, Bank of England paper last year, the Bank for International Settlements paper last year. They're laying the blueprint, guys. It's going to be you and me and the rest of America, the first world, that's going to pay for this. That's their plan. And then they're going to inflate us to death. And they say it. They spell it right out in their paper here. And I've got some quotes that uh, we can get into later from the paper, but I, I think that's probably a good intro. That's that's I think, is number one. We're very close to it in 2014. Yeah, right. uh, it if I can interject here, you're t um, Andy Sutton, uh, you're talking about your pay or your uh, blog entry called the Malachi Crunch Continues. I take it, uh, which is on Sutton-Associates.net. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. All right. So, sorry, V. Go ahead. Hey, no problem. But uh, again, that that that's heavy. And and uh, for those who had their heads, uh, you know, in the sand, or you're one of those people that are just sitting on the fence. 2014 is going to be turning out into a year of action. You know, I, I've talked this out with uh, with Andy and Ken. You know, we, we kind of came to the consensus that, you know, from 2008 all the way to 2013 is a, a year of transition. They they got these new regulations in. They're getting in these new laws that are going on the books, that are going active. And 2014 is the year of implementation. It's a watershed moment. Uh, Ken, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, the, you know, Pretty much, pretty much what we're seeing transpiring today started in September in Syria. Okay, that was pretty much, as V just mentioned, the watershed moment. Because of the fact that the United States military might, which is truly the only protection for the petrodollar anymore, was uh, rebutted by Russia and by uh, the lack of coalition from the European Union and NATO, uh, what ended up happening was you had a pullback, and immediately China decides to take uh, over the Sekaku Islands and uh, put some onus against Japan, which is struggling under its own uh, inflationary scare and, and Fukushima and their lack of productivity, et cetera. So then you've got that as you move into uh, the implementation of Obamacare. Now you have something that's domestic. Instead of the, the people being able to look out at macro um, economics and what's going on financially and global, now they're looking at their own pocketbooks. And they're seeing that their, their discretionary spending is gone. And they're seeing that their, uh, their income going into 2014 is going to be cut in, in a, by a third because they're doubling and tripling their rates on insurance. You're seeing a lot of uh, kids that are sitting with these student loans going, I'm not going to get insurance, I don't care. Of course, they already have the mentality being young that they're going to last forever, so uh, I guess that's <laughs> something the progressives can take into consideration. Uh, then, you, then you go into the holiday, holiday season, okay? Or actually, yeah, the government shut down first. The government shut down, if you remember, <laughs> on the second day of the shutdown, did, did uh, Boehner in Congress go to the president? No, 15 CEOs, 15 bank yes, CEOs. Right. They were setting up what was going to take place going forward. Okay, forget they already planned when they were going to stop the shutdown. The reason that they did this too was because the the ten year treasury was just about to hit over three percent. Right. And if you notice coming out of the sixteen day shutdown, ah, oh, the treasury's back to two point five four. It's not too bad. And and they welcomed in the holiday season. Well, as you got to the holiday season, there's one important aspect that I was looking at, and it was the fact that uh, what would the consumer do? Would the consumer spend? And there was a new chart that uh, I found that showed that if the current year's holiday sh shopping, what was spent, the, the money spent, was less than the year before, <laughs> then every time over the past 30 years, the next year was a recession. Well, guess what? 
we just came out. We had we had 27 percent less foot traffic on Main Street in in the stores. We had 1.4 percent drop in online sales from year before. So we automatically hit that. We spent less than we did the year before. Then instantly, a few days later, Macy's Macy's is shutting down five stores and, and canning 2,500 people. They know that they know the signals. Sears is gone. J.C. Penney's is gone. Okay, the the job numbers we could go into that, but that that was just uh, that was a disaster. Okay, so we got that going going forward. So now we have all these things set for a non-recovery, a great recessionary period, and the United States losing its uh, reputation both militarily and and economically. So when we go into 2014, we've had uh, Gerald Salente talk about April. We've had Peter Schiff talk about the collapse this year. We've had George Urey and the WebBots talk about the first quarter of, of that. We've got all these different people talking 2014. The important thing is, is there are a lot of scenarios that could happen, but more importantly, what are the indicators to look for that we know is actually in play? That's right. And those indicators are something that's very important. Um, most people, you know, we, we talk about the mass media and the misreporting of what's going on in terms of the real numbers. And, uh, you know, we talk about um, amongst ourselves, gentlemen, uh, the fact that the data is so skewed. And, Andy, you mentioned something about that. Uh, if you could just uh, elaborate on that a little bit, on how skewed the real numbers that people are reading in the newspapers, watching on the TV, listening to the mainstream media, telling everybody, it's all right, the ship's not taking on any water, everything's fine, go back to your staterooms, go back to your, 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 your board games and your reality TV, there's nothing to see here. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you, you, uh, Ken just talked about the jobs report today. Every time you look at a jobs report, you're, you're looking at basically it's a fabrication. You know, you've got this whole idea, well, well, you know, this is what we think happened, and then we have these fictitious businesses that may or may not have been created, and they're always adjusting that, and then they, later they quietly go back and, and they perform massive reductions, and it, it always ends up, and we're, we're about due for uh, for 2013 here, uh, you know, what they actually go ahead and, 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 and readjust that down. That, so that's a sham. The unemployment, that's a joke. GDP is a joke. I'll tell you why GDP is a huge joke, because what we do is we our government borrows money, a lot of money, a trillion bucks, trillion and a half bucks on the high side a year, minimum. And then what they do is they count that as growth. You can't count that as growth. So if you, you start pulling these, you know, these types of things out of GDP, all of a sudden you don't even have two and a half or two and a quarter percent growth, you're, you're negative. So, I mean, that, that's a joke. Then you look at retail sales. That's measured in dollars. Okay, so I'll use a quick example. Say you had an economy and people bought 100 gallons of gas at 3 bucks a gallon. That's, so your retail sales would be 300 bucks. And then the next year, gas goes up to $4, but the people buy the same 100 gallons. Well, retail sales is now $400. All of a sudden, the media comes out and says, wow, Retail sales are up 33.3% year over year, but the people didn't buy anything more. They just paid more. So that's a sham. All these statistics are fudged. They're manipulated. It's, it's done for political reasons, and Rogoff and Reinhardt get right out to it. And I'm going to read a quote here from page three of their white paper, and they say, It is certainly true that policymakers need to manage public expectations I rest my case. Hmm. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're managing expectations. Unbelievable. Wow. wow. And that just goes into the whole Keynesian nonsense of sure. a managed, centrally planned economy. Yes, and, and you know who the queen of that's going to be? And we talked about this yesterday, you, Ken, and I, and that's going to be Janet Yellen. She, she's, mm -hmm. a, she's the biggest dove with condor-sized wings when it comes to <laughs> monetary policy. Well, you know, today is interesting. Today is interesting because you had the mass, you had a drop in unemployment of three-tenths of a percent, okay? You only had 74,000 jobs created out of an estimated 174,000. That means you had less. You had 
three three or four no uh, five times less than the average needed per month to keep up with the population, and yet the unemployment yep. rate goes down. But what people don't see is five hundred thousand fell off the participation rolls. So this yeah. is an interesting thing if you look at all the numbers that have occurred today for all the technical wonks out there. Okay, we had a ten point drop on the ten year. <coughs> we had gold go up about twenty do- twenty bucks. And then we had the Fed come out and say, uh, okay, unemployment's going down, but we're still going to go ahead and do the taper. <laughs> so you're getting all the, it's confusion. They don't know what they're doing. And, and as, as Andy just said, the progressives and the Keynesians rely on trial balloons. You throw something against the wall, you see what the public reaction is, you see what the market reaction is, and then if it's good, you go forward. If not, then you throw out another scheme. Like, uh, what was the President Obama's speech this week? Oh, yeah, promise zones. That's that's a, that's a NLP word for job creation? No, it's an NLP <laughs> word for funneling more federal funds to ACORN. Mm. Exactly. More obfuscation. Exactly. That's, that's what it's all about these days. And this, this uh, recent IMF paper, uh, I think, is nothing more than a trial balloon. But the kicker is, it's not really a trial balloon because a lot of this stuff has already happened. And that's what I think people need to understand about this. And we can get into this later if you guys want to. Uh, the Absolutely. five steps that they recommend to get out of, quote, unquote, get out of this mess that we're in. And you look at that, and those things have not only have they been done in the recent past, they've been done historically. You know, you rip people off with inflation, you default on debt. <laughs> You do all these types of things, and you know now we're talking about bail-ins. That's that's a relatively newer animal, but you know you've got all these tactics that are being used. The average person sitting out there looking at all this, and they know, they know, and this is why I think these holiday numbers were as tepid as they were. People have a feeling, even if they don't look at this stuff every day. They don't, they don't know. It's kind of like you're driving a car. And you're missing a cylinder. You know, you got eight cylinders. One of them's not quite working right. You just know something's not right. And I think that's where most people are at today. And they they feel like, all right, you know what? Maybe I just ought to be just a tad more careful than I was last year because this just this just doesn't seem right. And what's with America getting thrown out of Syria? That's a big deal. I mean, I you can't even you can't even overstate that how big a deal that is the power has shifted away from us we lost the wealth now we're losing the influence you know and like ken said we we have bombs and paper we use paper to cover up our problems and then when that doesn't work then we use bombs and guess what they're calling our bluff and the power is shifting absolutely and i think what what people need to understand on a world stage we are become not really a, a toothless tiger but the fact is we are so economically buckled, so much so to the point that the Chinese and the Russians can not only leverage our economic weaknesses against us, but they have done it in such a way that they are creating massive shifts in U.S. international projections and policy. Folks, it's come to the point, and Andy mentioned this when I, when I spoke uh, to, uh, to him earlier, and we came into the same consensus. The Chinese and the Russians have sent a, uh, they've created a precedent. And that precedent is this. If you are being bullied by the United States, just yep. cozy up to the Chinese and the Russians, and they will protect you. And that's what has happened. And since this whole ser- the September 23rd debacle, which was the last-ditch Hail Mary play by the Anglo-American power structure, and when that fell apart, you can see that they had not a single leg to stand on. They had no coalition. They had no consensus. They had no consortium. They have absolutely nothing to go into Syria and, 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 and the greater goal, which is Iran, and then, of course, the absolute prize, which is the energy-rich market, in, in that, that's Europe. And they got stopped. And that's what the world is starting to realize, folks. We are a broke nation. And I've said this oftentimes on air. When a nation goes broke, its security apparatus, because it's got its can kicked overseas, 
is now going to be focusing inward because that's what broke nations do. They prey on their own populace. And, folks, the worst part is we're no longer the, uh, the toothless. We're, we're even worse than a toothless tiger. We've come to the point that we are becoming the hemorrhoid of the world. And people don't want to deal with us anymore. We are a nuisance. And that's what this uh, current administration has brought us down to. Ken, do you want to add to that? Yeah, uh, adding on something you were saying there, you know what's interesting about the Fed, okay? They've been, they've been. if you go back to actually what Keynes wrote about, uh, John Maynard Keynes believed that uh, government spending would help boost an economy. But he equivocally said that it had to be short-term. It was almost like a quick boost to the system to get uh, corporate and manufacturing that going, and then you pull back. It does not work if you do it for long term. So, the, you know, calling the Feds Keynesian up to a point, yeah, the original ones going back were, but the ones we have going from Greenspan going forward are something that's even more maniacal. The reason I say this, because we've been doing a form of quantitative easing since probably 2010, 2009, Entering into about the middle of 2014, if we continue the path we are now, we are going to reach that point where Fed creation of money will have will have reached zero point diminishing returns. Okay, right now there it is less than a dollar GDP or it's one dollar GDP for something like five dollars, maybe ten dollars of Fed printed money. At a certain point, no matter amount of uh, Fed printed money is going to create even one dollar of GDP. When that happens, you're going to see the debt to GDP ratio hyperinflate and skyrocket out of here. And that's going to happen by the middle of 2014. So I think the Fed is seeing this, and the, that's why they're sort of talking the taper, but they know the fact that the second they remove the money, because, you know, there's a fascinating uh, study that came out uh, today, or actually a couple days ago. Corporations spent $500 billion buying back their own stock this year. Right. You want to know why the stock stock market is all-time highs? It's not because yeah. anybody actually bought stocks or bought re or retailers came in. It's because uh, companies spent $500 billion, half of Q, of the $1.2 trillion QE, QE forever this year on their own, buying back their own stock. You know, for those who have watched Carl Icahn and his antics, all year, buying a big block of Apple shares, <laughs> and then trying to dictate to Apple that they need to buy back their stock. This is exactly why he was saying that, because everybody else is doing it. But Apple's sitting there going, we got $175 billion in cash. We don't have any debts. Oh, we have no need to do that. And who are you going to tell, tell us how to run our company? But the problem is, is that everybody else did. Now, if everybody else is doing that, there's an interesting dichotomy that happens and this happened in 2007 when a comp when a uh, when more stock is actually purchased by the companies to remove it from the market then actual trading took place okay that leaves about maybe maybe 10 to 15 percent left and that's usually when the retail retail comes in to fill that final last void and then the bottom drops out it happened in 2007 we spent more money in 2013 than we did in 2007 buying back uh, company stock. We saw what happened in 2008. We're going to see that happen in 2014. You know, Absolutely. I want to just kick in there, Ken, uh, if it's possible to uh, agree 100% on that because that's been something that that was something that I was watching back in in 07 and 08, just the the amount of buybacks. And I have to add, uh, when you take a look at uh, credit market debt. Uh, by these companies, corporate debt is just going through the roof. So not only it's it's not that these companies are making all of this money on operations and from revenue, they're they're borrowing it because it's cheap. <coughs> and in some cases, they're getting it, you know, whether it's from the government, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the QE vehicle, uh, or they're they're just you know issuing issuing new debt. Whatever the case is, uh, th this this whole thing is a shell game. You know, yeah, the money was there to buy, to, to buy the stocks back, drove the market up. That looks good because the average person equates the stock market with the health of the economy. So that looks great. Here's the management of expectations again. 
But on the opposite side of that, again, it's a reversible transaction because these debts at some point, unless you want to listen to Rogoff and Reinhardt here, they need to be repaid. And that's why, that's why these papers that these guys write now, they're not policy yet, uh, although in some cases they're, they're quickly becoming that. That's why these papers are so important, these trial balloons. What they're trying to do is see what's going to happen uh, from a reaction standpoint from uh, the, you know, academia, institutions, uh, corporations, uh, you know, those, those sectors, and see how they're going to react to this kind of stuff. And, hey, are they going to accept that? Well, guess what? They accepted Cyprus. Nobody, nobody had a problem with that. Nobody even blinked at Poland. We're in big trouble. No, it's interesting, interesting what happened in France. You see what happened in France over the weekend? Goodyear plant, no. Goodyear plant's uh, pulling out of France, and they've already yeah. stopped manufacturing. They've already stopped production. Right. They're just going through the motions of shutting down the plant. But according to French social social uh, rule, is you still have to pay full salary to all the workers, even though they're not producing anything and the thing is shutting down. Well, <laughs> some of the workers actually took two of the bosses hostage. Yes, I remember that one, <laughs> at yeah. gunpoint. <laughs> yes, yes. Kept them over and, and you know saying you will keep the you know the business here and you will keep paying us. That's that's how bad it's gotten and of course we know Holland has already just gotten uh, carte blanche Oof. for a seventy five percent tax rate on those making <laughs> on and those companies doing giving a million euros in in salary. So it's you know when you talk about the trial balloon. This is, I think, where the biggest we're seeing it now. We saw the Cyprus. That was accepted. That was, you know, there wasn't that much um, civil unrest, even though people were ticked off. But France. France is going to be, okay, what happens if we tax them? Because that IMF paper, I believe, talks about that wanting to implement a 71% tax on anybody making over a million U.S. dollars in every single country in the industrialized world. Yes, yeah, we're going back to the Great Depression time where, you know, the, the highest rate was around 90%. So, like I said, this stuff's already been done before. Uh, they're they're going right back to the old playbook, and it, it's so far, it's it's working for them now. France ought to be interesting. If it works there, they'll move on to the next one, and the domino will fall. And here's the kicker: back in the Great Depression, when the uh, effective tax rate was 85 to 90 percent, you had enough loopholes, enough deduction that nobody even played that rate. Now, the kicker is this. With the new types of agreements that are coming into play, especially with FATCA, especially with Dodd-Frank, especially with TPP, uh, I'm telling you right now, all those loopholes that allowed the average individual to take down those deductions, to have all these offsets on their tax returns, those are done. Now, when they put out a law that these policy wanks are writing out, saying you've got to pay 75% tax on your income, guess what, folks? it's going to be 75% of what you make. And that's what it's coming down to. The, we, we, you want to talk about clamping down, you want to talk about putting teeth on this thing, that's exactly what they're doing. And that, I think, is the big difference. We're worse than where we were in, during the Great Depression. And it's, uh, it, it's going to be unbelievable going into 2014. Now, you know, Ken, you talked about uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, the fact that the, the the Fed printing going to zero sum gain triggering hyperinflation, and uh, I'm just going to ask Andy this now. You know we've had the luxury, okay, folks. We've had the luxury of being the world reserve currency, and we have that that wonderful ability to export our inflation. Andy, what do you think is going to happen when all those dollars come back home to roost? Well, can you say ten, twelve dollar a gallon gas? Uh, fifteen dollar loaves of bread. It's going to be bad. That's exactly what's going to happen because what's ha you know we talked about this on the phone yesterday. All these countries, mm -hmm. you know, China, Russia, and all their all the little the, the little allies that they're picking up, they're all cutting deals to sidestep the dollar. So that right. kills the demand for dollars. And right. you've got a you've got a printing machine, computers. They're not really a printing press per se anymore, but you've got a printing machine that just keeps cranking these things out, and the fewer and fewer people that want this, yeah, this is going to get accelerated very quickly, I have a feeling. It's going to be good, it's going to be good, it's going to be okay, okay, yeah, kind of, and then gone. That's how I think this is going to work. Yep. Well, there's, there's somebody yeah. in agreement with you, Andy. 
How about John Williams' shadow stats? Yeah. Yes. John Williams' shadow stats. He came out and said explicitly. Now, the thing about John Williams is, John Williams has always sat in the background. He just does his charts. He'll do his occasional That's thing, it. but he'll speak on direct information. Now he's coming out with a prediction. He never comes out from behind the, the curtain. Oh, I know. He came out with a, uh, uh, this week with uh, Greg Hunter and USA Watchdog. He said, there will, and he said will, be a dollar panic in 2014 as foreigners dump their currency holdings. Period. Jeez, I, w- <laughs> I wonder what, why that would be. You know, people need to understand that uh, as, you know, all three of us are here on Doug and Joe's show talking about the economy, that as we're talking about 60% of the largest, most powerful economies in the world are, have already set up currency swaps bypassing the dollar. Hey, Ken, what happened to Obama when he went to go to those ASEAN nations and the Asia-Pacific Union when they were talking about the uh, <laughs> business deals? Why don't, we, why don't we highlight that for a second so people get an idea of, 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 of where the United States is on the grand scheme of, of the world stage? Yeah, uh, let, me go, let me go back one event before it. Okay, Good. we got to go back to way, pull back the way back clock to September of 2012. Now, September of 2012 was just before the elections, and there was I think there was something that happened during that time that uh, people weren't paying attention. But on the global scale, this was one of those uh, game changers to end game changers. We have already have sanctions on Iran, so we're thinking mm-hmm. that we can uh, push Iran into giving up its nuclear program so it can sell oil. Uh, okay. Well, what happened in uh, about 7th of September of 2012? Russia and China made an agreement. Uh, China had has the infrastructure and set up yes. to become a wholesaler, buying and selling oil to anyone in any currency. Boom. The first attack on the petrodollar since 1973. Yep. Right. Secondly, at the, on the exact same day, they made an agreement with Russia, who has all the oil in the world, yeah. And said Russia was said we will sell you as much oil as you want, so they automatically now have a supply chain. And yeah. so what they did was they started going to Iran and buying their oil. So the economic sanctions hurt a little bit, but not as much. And that's why the U.S. could never impose it, what it wanted on the nuclear program. Okay, then we fast forward to about October. There's the ASEAN ASEAN uh, conference. Fifteen Asian countries getting together. Well, Obama, that's when he decided to take his Asia trip. And he went over there, and he was there for two days, and then all of a sudden he came back early. <laughs> and then we find out that he tried to come in, and in this in this agreement, this trade agreement that was being done by these 15 Asian countries, Obama wanted the U.S. to be a part of it. And they said, get out of town. Go back. You're, you're, you're so yesterday. And so these 15 countries made a new trade agreement, which encompassed three billion people, which is 40% of the entire world's population, that they would start allowing trade amongst each other in with uh, currencies outside the dollar, bypassing SWIFT, bypassing the BIS, and leaving the U.S. to you know try to find trade partners well with whomever. <laughs> so that, that's what you had going with, with uh, the ASEAN thing. Now you move forward. And, of course, you have even even greater in 2013 because uh, China has been making headroads into Africa. China has been making headroads in Afghanistan. China's make, because China goes in as opposed to the U.S., which is now being like Great Britain. See, the U.S. The US empire has become Great Britain. If, you're, if anybody remembers the, uh, the opium wars of the 1870s, yes. uh, China wanted to do some reforms, and they wanted to get rid of uh, get all their people off the addiction of opium. Well, Britain thought they could make some serious money in the opium trade, so they sent in warships and they forced the Chinese people to not only buy it but consume it. Okay, so they started using the gun, you know. And we saw in Suez. Suez was finally when the British Empire cracked and was gone. But every single time, uh, at a certain point, it was no longer trade that was allowing the British Empire to uh, stay afloat. It was it's military might. That's what we're seeing in the U.S. We have nothing to offer anymore. So we're, we're yeah. trying to do it militarily. Well, guess what? Syria, to us, was the Suez to the British. 
Because right. the U.S. told Britain and France, stand down. And that was the end of the British uh, domination. And it was the start of the great American empire. Suez was that. Now we have it in Syria, and Russia says, uh-uh, bye-bye, you're nothing. And so Obama went his, plus the fact that President Obama, I don't think, has the will or fortitude to stand toe-to-toe with anybody he can't browbeat. So right. China and Russia are out. It's it's over. So that. So now we have this. The the key thing, what you're seeing about this, uh, what's going to happen going forward, is China has already set up the trade. You know, the, what V talked about, the 23 swap lines, guess who's involved in that? Britain, Germany, European Union, the West is seeing the writing on the wall, and Western nations, at least not the southern ones, but the northern Western nations are suddenly going, guess what, there's a new world economic power. We're going to make sure that we get involved in this and we're going to get tied to it. So they're moving away from the U.S. and they're moving to China due to this, so they know the inevitability that the dollar's reserve currency status is, is very close to being done, and they're preparing for it. That's the important thing. And since China has already set up the trade coalitions, they don't need U.S. product. They, they don't need U.S. to buy their products anymore. It's over. Right. So they've yeah. eliminated that. And what you're going to see, what you're going to see, and this is what uh, what uh, John Williams was saying. At a certain point, you're going to see the Chinese, the Japanese, everybody else, especially the Japanese. I think they're going to need capital ASAP when they start going into hyperinflation. So they're going to they're going to be the first ones to dump. I get the feeling they're going to be the first ones to dump to save whatever they have left. But we go forward to what's going on with that, and we see China setting up. And once they start dumping those, uh, the you know, it was interesting, too. The trade deficit went down this month or last month. <laughs> what that's saying to the Chinese is Americans aren't buying stuff. Well, if we're not buying stuff, then the Chinese don't need us anyway. And it's going to make it even quicker that they're going to, they're going to cut off that that supply chain, and they're going to say bye bye, and go to a new right. currency because they're already on top of it. Exactly, exactly, and that's what people need to understand, folks. Is this is not a cycle. You know, as we're speaking to you, we're we're seeing a, a massive global realignment, okay, abroad, and then domestically, we're seeing a massive uh, paradigm shift to the worst over here. So this is not a cycle. It's not as business as usual. And, and the old ad is there's certain axioms that need to be destroyed, especially with what uh, with what Ken mentioned with China. And one of those things is you know you hear it all the time. Oh, China needs us to buy uh, buy their junk. They do not. Over the last decade or so, the strongest sector in the Chinese economy is not their manufacturing. It's actually their banking. And their banks are much better capitalized than ours. In fact, they're, they're, they've beaten us this year and the year before. Okay, so That's one of the things that people need to understand. That this is not some, uh, some minor thing. And Americans need to wake up and understand that. Um, Andy, you want to add something to that? Yeah, and I might add that in order for our banks to be as well capitalized as they allegedly are, we have to employ <laughs> all sorts of shenanigans. Uh, like FASB Rule 157 and Mark to Model Mar- uh, Accounting and all of these other types of things. Yeah, the, the interesting point, adding on to what Ken said, when this thing, you know, when this whole thing reaches that critical mass, and I, and I really, I, I do really uh, agree with John Williams on this. This is going to be one of those things. And I'll say it again because I think it's really important. People are not going to see this coming. It's going to, it's going to be sort of okay. We're just kind of muddling along, and that's really what we've been doing for the last five years is just right. muddling along, getting a little worse, but eh, tolerable. And all of a sudden, when, when the math hits the, right, uh, hits the right point in time and those curves go parabolic and all that inflation that we've exported comes back home and the chickens roost, we're going to be in deep trouble. And now, what are we going to offer to get goods when everybody else, is trading in non-dollar currencies. We have worthless green tickets and bombs. Are we going to try and go to war with the whole world so that Walmart can have stuff on their shelves? That's not going to work. What are we going to do to get stuff? 
our manufacturing infrastructure, yeah, we have some things, but for the most part, can we self-sustain? Not a chance. We're going to have to give up some big-time resources here in this country, whether it be timber, uh, <coughs> natural gas, the Bakken, uh, coal, whatever it may be, we're going to have to give away big-time stuff just to keep ourselves muddling along. If, if, I, if, I, can, if I can jump in here, uh, uh, gentlemen, and ask this question, a Andy, how does that work? I, I, I mean, uh, practically, on a practical level, how does that work? Well, I mean, if you've got all these countries that are trading outside, and they've all cut deals. We have no deals. Even our even our friends are leaving us. You know, the, uh, Ken and V just said, you know, the, England, Germany, they're leaving us. So we don't we don't have deals cut with anybody. We're we're going to have to go out there and try and broker deals with people to get things that we need on a totally new paradigm that we're totally not expecting and not not used to operating under. We're used to being the big dogs on the block and all of a sudden we just, we just got kicked off the porch and that's going to, that, you know, how this whole thing practically shapes up on main street is going to be very, it's going to, it's going to be traumatic for the American people because all of a sudden you're going to have generations of people that are used to a certain way of living all of a sudden being told no. And that's going to be, a, that's going to be traumatic for people. Yeah, right. yeah and, and gentlemen, and I hope he knows this, and uh, our our audience is uh, perhaps one of the most educated audiences of all radio history, and I, and I believe that. Um, the, the question, and even I'm looking at this, standing back and saying, now, you know, how is this going to play out? I, I mean, for, no, number one, I cannot believe, uh, it, I, t to me, it's so difficult for me to believe that, that people can actually believe what they're hearing in the mainstream media. Um, of, of course, that allows the people to go out and buy the big screen TVs and everything that we see, and, and, and everything seems normal. Everything seems not not even normal, but even life is good, better than normal. So this is going to hit the average person right between the eyes when this happens, um, I, I suspect. And, and I, I'm just trying to get a really get a handle on what this is going to look like, I guess. Well, I, I'll uh, tell you this. Uh, when When you study over eight to 900 years of human economic activity, one of the things that always pops out at you is this. When hyperinflation hits, the population never realizes it. It takes them by surprise every single time. And that's what's going to happen here. It's going to be quick. It's going to be sudden. And when I give those analogies, folks, that you're going to go to sleep on a Friday, and then Monday you wake up and you go pump your gas, and you see the guy standing outside, you know, changing the price on the tags over there, and you see 12 to $15 per gallon. I'm talking about that quick. And you now people say, well, how is this going to happen? Because we don't, we don't have a, you know, when, when this whole economic reset goes through, we don't have a dog in the fight. We don't have nothing to trade. Let me tell you how that works. We've seen this happen before in the perfect uh, example would be Greece. What happened when Greece went under, when they went belly up? There was a fire sale on Greek assets and infrastructure. Greek yep. islands were up for grab. Greek bridges were up for grab. Highways, land, timber, I mean, you name it. Power supply lines, utilities, water plants. Everything was up for grabs. Why? Well, they were so darn in debt that they had nothing to offer. Nobody bought Greek bonds except for a few stupid Japanese insurance companies. And John Corzine. <laughs> and John Corzine. <laughs> that that was it. So how did you get how, how did they cope with it? Well, you know, it's you know from my sources were telling me when they were a uh, you know, over there in Greece, you know, the, you saw Steve Forbes out there. Hey, we're, look, we're having a fire, so we're buying this, we're buying that, and that's exactly how they're going to do uh, deal with it over here. The cronies, you got to understand, the the vultures that are in control of this, who don't know how to create anything because all they've done is destroy things, are going to do the only thing that they know how is to offer up what's left because all the meat's been pulled from the bones. 
So whatever's left is just going to be the bones itself, which is basically the structure of the animal. And that is how we're going to get uh, conglomerated into a new global economic system. Uh, Ken, do you want to add something? Yeah, you know what? I was just thinking, you know what? When, when hyperinflation, and I know some people have talked about this, um, I think uh, Steve Quayle on the show has mentioned this. When hyperinflation hits, the, there's going to be products on the shelves, but you won't be able to afford them. You know, the more I think about it, I think because of the global supply chain we have, as opposed to Weimar Germany back in the day in Zimbabwe, I think it's going to be just the opposite. I think hyperinflation will kick in when the Chinese and whoever supplies Walmart and such stops. They no longer accept dollars. They no longer accept any type of asset. Boom. They stop shipping stuff. Nothing comes in. So the shelves are empty, and people are going to have a ton of money, and whatever is left is then going to be priced so high, that's where you're going to get price hyperinflation more than you get monetary at first. I don't know. What do you guys think? Go ahead, Andy. You want to answer that? You know what? That's a very good point because the two are totally different animals. Monetary yeah. hyperinflation and, and price hyperinflation. I, I I agree with that. And you know, we talked about this. You know, again uh, yesterday, going back to Syria. What exactly did Putin say to our people? I mean, he took them out behind the woodshed and beat them like a rented mule. Literally. <laughs> what did he? What What was the hammer? that he held over their heads, and, and, and V and I were talking, and Ken, we were all talking about this. What was the hammer? And we thought, well, maybe, it was, maybe it's this whole, you know, the whole thing with interest rates, the bond market, uh, you know, that whole thing. That seems like a good hammer. You know what another possible hammer is, too? This idea of, hey, you know what? We don't need you anymore. You guys don't back off, and the container ships stop crossing the Pacific Ocean. I mean, what do you guys think about that? There you go. It's very viable, and what uh, Ken said, monetary hyperinflation versus uh, price hyperinflation. I think we're going to get both of you guys. I think it's exactly what's going to happen. When you look at how supermarkets and uh, most large retailers buy things, it's all done on lines of credit. So you look at that, I think, uh, I think we're going to have the best of both worlds. Um, you know, and, and that's what people are going to face. It's going to be a, 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 a triple-headed monster here. You're going to have monetary uh, inflation, price inflation, then you're going to have stagflation because there's going to be zero jobs, zero growth. You're going to have a contracting economy. So it, it's going to be an absolute nightmare. And what are we going to do? You know, that's, that's the whole thing that Americans don't understand is that, you know, this is a reality. This is not some uh, uh, pie-in-the-sky type stuff. This is a reality that's coming soon to roost. Uh, Ken, you want to add to that? Yeah, and I think this is this scenario is why Jim Willie came out with his prediction for 2014. Now he's been he's been promoting uh, hearing down the pipeline of a gold backed trade note, and what it's going to do is since the dollar is the international trade currency, the reserve currency, everything goes through there. Is China is going to is going to completely bypass and end SWIFT and the BIS. And, and the IMF, you know, something we forgot, too, to add that was added in there was the BRICS Bank. Right. The Good BRICS point. Bank was created with uh, a lot of, in, you know, money infused in it, hundreds of billions of dollars, because they're going to offer all these countries who want to do trade with them a chance to uh, bypass the IMF without having to get forced austerity on them. And Correct. so you're going to see the IMF sort of wane away because – who supplies most of the IMF? The U.S. with dollars. Well, if nobody's yeah. borrowing dollars. Who cares? You know, the IMF just wastes away. But that being said, um, Jim Willie is talking about 2014 is going to be the year of the currency reset and the gold back trade note. And what what this really entails is is that China is going to come out and they're going to start offering a gold backed international note. This is going to be the currency of international trade. It's it's going to be. Outside, you know, between, say, Venezuela and, and China, or between Russia and Germany, et cetera, et cetera. All currencies are pretty much, especially fiat currencies, are going to suddenly become internal and domestic only. You know, your dollar is not going to be worth anything. You go to Italy, 
and the Italian lira goes to Turkey, and it's going to be worth nothing. It's all going to be the international gold trade note. It's going to be gold back. So that's where the U.S. is going to really fall from a first world country to a second world country because obviously we had no gold. The only thing we have is the oil in the Bakken region, and we are probably going to be able to use that asset to at least have some reserve to be able to get gold or in these trade notes to make to trade at all. But it's going to be gold, and this is one of the reasons why smart people, at least in the East, are buying gold. Because when this happens, this currency reset happens, what what I've read about this currency reset is they're planning on taking all the country, all the nations and they're gonna they're gonna put them in an order dependent upon their assets. So like number one may be China, number two would be Russia, number three would be India, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, down the road. Um and then depending on where you are on that list, they're going to devalue your currency by a certain percentage. So if you're China, you're going to get your currency devalued 30%. If you're number 200 on that list, your currency is going to be pretty much devalued 90%. I'm thinking we're going to get hit with about 30 to 40% uh, devaluation of the dollar, right off the top. That's going to eliminate the hyperinflation, but it's going to pretty much remove whatever rest of the wealth, and you're going to be dealing with dollars that are going to all be internal only. Um, so those who have gold and silver... Of course, they're going to remonetize that to probably about fifty thousand dollars an ounce for gold because it's going to be used primarily in this international trade note and then silver or whatever. So, you know, that's what's going to happen. That's how they're going to deal with the hyperinflation is a currency reset. But you're pretty much going to lose whatever wealth you have. Uh, that's one of the biggest yeah, I, things I, I don't. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, oh no 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 no! I just can't let this slip by. Fifty thousand dollars an ounce for gold. Uh, yep, absolutely. Right now, if it does when you when you look at uh, when you really adjust, and I, in one of my articles on Rogue Money, I kind of pointed it out. Uh, when you adjust uh, gold for for you know you take the real laws of supply and demand, and then the inflation aspects of it, gold should be about eh, anywhere between ten and eleven thousand dollars an ounce right now. So fifty thousand uh, dollars an ounce is it, it's really not a, a a shot in the dark. It's it's it's, it's a reality, especially when you're talking about a forty to fifty percent dollar devaluation. And, re okay. and remember wow. this, remember this. Jim Sinclair is the one who's saying it's fifty thousand dollars, and Jim Sinclair just got invited to help run the I think the Hong Kong or the Shanghai um, futures market for their metals. So yep. the pro the thing is, is we. We, the West, and we, the U.S., are not going to be monetizing the value of gold and silver. The Far East is. So right. we don't know exactly what their agenda and what their beliefs are. Okay? So we're, we've been thinking about what, what we here in the West might monetize at, oh, $3,000 next year, maybe seven, 8000 No. They have the gold. Them that has the gold makes the rules. And that's why China is probably going to make it that high because, you know what? When you do trade, you're doing trade in billions of dollars, okay? A country like Peru doesn't have that much gold, so they have to have what little value assets they have. They have to have enough of something so that they can be able to afford to import billions of dollars worth of goods back and forth, okay? So that's why you've got to, in my opinion, you've got to monetize gold to that level because it's got to be able to be a tradable currency, the trade note, in just about every country, including the poorest. But, but if I can ask this one more question here. But the average guy, let's say I'm fortunate enough to have, I don't know, maybe a half a dozen 10-ounce 10 10 ounce coins or even somebody who has maybe two or three um, uh, one-ounce coins in, in their home safe, for example. It, that, 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 that price is meaningless to them, though, right? Because there's no practical... Uh, I don't even know how to even ask the question. Uh, you know, after this hearing fifty thousand an ounce, I mean, does that mean that if I had three gold coins in my home safe, I'd be I'd be holding on the equivalent of um, one hundred fifty thousand dollars in today's dollars? Well, take into consideration what uh, maybe a percentage lopped off that if we have a re currency reset and our currency is devalued. So, say if today. It's worth fifty thousand U.S. dollars, and the currency is lopped off forty percent. Okay, so then you could probably buy, I don't know, 
um, 25,000, no, maybe about 20,000 U.S. dollars of the new currency. This is why gold and silver uh, always, or gold has always been wealth protection because it still crosses over no matter what currency is in play. And if there's a new gotcha. currency, internal domestic, and there's a new devaluation, well, you know, gold and silver stands on the outside. It always stands on the outside. Its, it's price is only related to the price of whatever currency it's valued at. So here in China, in the international trade note, it may be $50,000, but here the U.S. dollar, the new U.S. dollar, if it's, that's what it's called, might be twenty to 25000 I understand now. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Very interesting. Uh, g gentlemen, we're up against the top of the hour already. This has been a fascinating first hour. I've got to tell you, f folks, you're listening to uh, V, the Gorilla Economist, Andrew Su and Andy Sutton, of course. Uh, folks, if you go to HomelandSecurityUS.com, our home base, right at the top, I put in here in the first hour links to Andy Sutton's blog, uh, links to roguemoney.net, which is V the Gorilla Economist website, and also links to Kenneth Shorgan, uh, Shorgan's articles, of course, at the Examiner. So visit homelandsecurityus.com. The links are right there for you. It's good show prep. It links to Andy Sutton's uh, blog entry. It links to the uh, roguemoney.net website, and of course, Ken Shorgan's um, uh, articles at the Examiner. Folks, you're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to hour number two of the Hagman and Hagman Report on this Friday, January 10th, 2014. We are joined by uh, some very interesting and, and informative people when it comes to the economy. Mr. Andy Sutton, Mr. Ken Shorgen, uh, silent T, and you, 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 you the Gorilla help Economist. Name? You go to HomelandSecurityUS.com, click on the top story at the, on the page there. You can find links to their websites. And uh, I'm going to ask you guys a question from a listener to open up this hour. Um, James asks, did something happen between the Fed and Germany this week? Is that, has anybody heard um, any talk? Yeah, I don't I know if this can, is uh, the goal or – okay. Yeah, the, the, uh, that's the issue where the Germans, if I remember correctly, and Ken, you, you probably remember this better than I do. Uh, my, my mind right now at the moment is a little vague. But at first, the Germans said that they received some of their gold back, uh, and uh, it was melted from the Fed. And then they changed their tune and said, "Oh, we melted the, that." The Germans said they, they themselves melted the gold. Uh, it, it, was that was that what I'm talking about, uh, Andy or Ken? Do you guys remember? I I, I know I mentioned this. I That's really something real... about that. Yeah. Yeah, I think the the gold uh, and the fact that they've gotten what like 300 tons or something back, you know, a small percentage. I think that's the only thing I've heard between the Fed and Germany in the last month or so. Yes, and, and there was some flip-flop on Germany's side, so I just don't remember what it was. It was there was something about that that was uh, a little, uh, you know, there's a, a discrepancy there. And uh, I'll have to uh, check back with my sources and to find out, you know, I have a... I have a guy at the, uh, you know, I got, I, I got, a, I have, a, I have an insider that I got to check with, and I'll get back to you on that. But there is a discrepancy there. I just don't remember exactly uh, what happened. Okay, I, I did uh, hear somebody, uh, some radio show host, talk about this, uh, and I don't know if this is what the listener was referring to or not. But apparently, we gave some of Germany, uh, their, some of their gold back to Germany, and it was not 100% pure, 99.9% pure. It was uh, a little bit lower quality than that. Um, and and the per whoever was talking about this on the air made the point that it wasn't like uh, he used an example of a wedding ring. If he gave a wedding ring to a bank in a safety deposit box, it would be like them going in there and opening it, melting down the ring. And when the, the person came to ask for their actual ring back, getting something different, getting a different ring and only on a much larger scale. And I don't know if that's what this was referring to, but uh, we know that the – Federal Reserve or the Fort Knox, people may say there's no gold in Fort Knox, and we see these countries asking for their gold back from the U.S., and if they start getting gold back at a lower quality than what they gave, um, I, I don't see that ending well. Well, you know, there, was, uh, there, was a, there was a story a couple of years ago, and it didn't get much play in the, the mainstream press, surprisingly, of <clears throat> people coming across some exchange bars that were basically salted with tungsten. And yeah. I'm wondering if this isn't kind of a reemergence of that whole issue, 
that it maybe is. the Fed's passing off some uh, <laughs> salted bars. Which no, it, it definitely is. I, I have that confirmed from my guys. Uh, it's it's tungsten. Let me tell you, the way it works is this. When there's a tour done at the Fed, okay, especially with foreign dignitaries, they want to see what their depositories look like. Off time, they're taken down into the uh, the vault. And the vault's right here in Liberty Street. It runs right underneath Liberty Street, and it connects to the the former JPM, uh, JP Morgan uh, vault, where their silver is stored. Okay, so those two vaults from the from from JP Morgan and, and, the, and the New York Fed are connected. Now, these people, the dignitaries, will be taken down there, and the vault is just open and say, "Hey, look at your gold. Here it is. Everything's fine. All right." The vault doors close. All right, folks. That's it. Show's over. Let's all go home. That's the extent of what they show you. No one takes the uh, the bars. No one looks at the serial numbers. Uh, and and also here's another crazy thing. When uh, we, this occurs with countries as well, where um, take for instance when India required uh, this past year some gold back from the Bank of England. It, it, and all of a sudden, the India report, oh, we, we got about uh, 100 metric tons or 200 metric tons of gold back from the Bank of England. The reality was no gold left the Bank of England vault. It was just a change in a book, in a ledger in a book. They just wrote it down in a book, we received it. There you go. That's how it is. This is the type of chicanery that goes on in the finance world. So in terms of the Fed, those gold bars that they're showing these dignitaries, my sources have said those are tungsten bars. Those are gold-dipped tungsten bars. We don't have any gold. Okay? Now, folks, there's a, it's not coincidence that the same 20-some-odd countries that are lining up asking for their gold back from the United States happen to be also the same 20-some-odd countries that are They're setting up currency swaps. Exactly. <laughs> so there you go. Wow! No, I, 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 I use that word. I, I'm sorry, I use the word "wow" a lot because I'm getting wowed all, all the time. I mean, it, the things you, you folks have just said uh, this evening—it's just incredible. Uh, it, we're living in some sort of alternate universe here. I, I, I really believe we are, and um, I, I don't—I I still don't understand why people aren't jumping up and down and, and screaming from the top of their lungs as to what's going on. But I guess that—I guess we're past talking about that. I—I I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead, sir. Oh no, no, that's fine. Uh, it, it, I, I'm reminded about what happened with J.P. Morgan when I think it was October or November. Uh, they pretty much are the ones who supply, I believe, the CFTC and the futures market, yep. and they yep. were having to borrow gold from these obscure little banks. They were completely out of gold. They were scared. To de- this is one of the reasons why they put so much pressure on India. This is why the Indian government is uh, putting all these pressures on its own people to stop buying gold because the U.S. is putting the thumb down on them. India right now would buy, like China, would buy as much gold uh, from the West uh, futures markets as they could get their hands on, but there's none. And if there's too much pressure of delivery, then the whole short uh, that J.P. Morgan and the rest of the banks have been doing to keep the dollar propped up will collapse, and that'll that'll be another trigger to, to bring everything. So... Right now, I, if you want to ask honestly why these things are happening, why did why did the U.S. send 300 tons of tungsten-filled gold to Germany? They're they're vying for time. Okay, right. there's no intention to ever do it. They're vying for time. They're not stupid. They see the writing on the wall. They see that the and you, you almost have two coalitions trying to get the Dominion in the next new financial world, you know, one world uh, market. The U.S. thinks and the and the West thinks that they have the the power and the prestige and the ability to do this. But China and Russia have been playing chess, and they've been doing this since the 1970s. They've been slowly wor- working in, whether it's from the, the Maoist, you know, post-Maoist reform China that saw the potential for an economic empire, from Russia, who saw that, hmm, the U.S. destroyed us because of economics. Guess what? We're going to do the same thing to them, and that's what they're doing. They're allowing, right. they're allowing the United States to try to build up and become this military, spread their military all over the place, and there's no money for it. And we're going to collapse just like Russia did. Only Russia this time says, ah, we have a resource. We don't have a lot of debt. As a matter of fact, we're building up our middle class, at least 
as well as Putin can. And same thing with China, because here's the thing. The Chinese people may be just slowly moving into the middle class. They may be just slowly, um, you know, coming out of an old uh, standard of living. But think about this. Since when would communist China ever persuade their own people to buy gold? They're pers- they want their, their people to buy gold. Because what's going to happen is when the new currency rollover takes place, okay, instantly – Every single Chinese uh, individual, worker, citizen, et cetera, who bought a little bit of gold is now automatically middle to upper middle class. They've created themselves a consumer, uh, a consumer base, all because they talked their own people into buying trinkets of gold. Right. What are we doing? We are standing there on CNBC <laughs> saying gold is a barbarous relic. A barbarous relic, you know. <laughs> And, uh, and, and you know what? You know what else we're doing? We spend hours on Thanksgiving and the day after beating each other up, shooting each other, and stabbing each other <laughs> over imported Chinese junk uh, that we're borrowing money to, to to purchase. And I use purchase very loosely. Uh, they're playing chess. We're we're playing tiddlywinks. Here in America, and <laughs> that's going to be our demise. We we are complacent. We are full of hubris. We think we can wave a flag and 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 do all that, and everybody's just going to bow. And it's just not that way anymore. And people had better wake up, and they'd better do it soon. Well, you know, not to worry, gentlemen. The the Apple iPhone six will be on the way. <laughs> oh, I, you know what? Everything's better now. <laughs> You know, one of the things that I always tell people is this, that we don't have an economy, okay? And I have often said that when you have a central bank that's manipulating your stock market, manipulating your real estate market, manipulating your bond market, you don't have an economy. And when you have a, 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 a what, what drives the market? I mean, let's be honest here. What, what drives the market? It's earnings, okay? And when you look at earnings from companies, all you see that, the so-called earnings that are also driving the market is just nothing but a bunch of gimmicks and accounting fraud. That's all it is. And we have this phantom growth. And it's unbelievable. This whole system that we have here, folks, is nothing but a bunch of drug-induced con men who are sitting there lying to each other. And they love it. They, They love creating the lie. They love selling the lie. They love buying the lie. They love telling you the lie, and the American public is just being lulled to sleep. And meanwhile, the whole world is, is, is left us, so to speak. We're like, the, we're like the drunk who's left behind in the party. The party's shut down, everybody's going home, and we're the idiot in the corner, still by the punch bowl, sipping away, uh, talking to themselves. <laughs> That's basically us. Uh, Ken or Andy, if you guys want to add to that, I just wanted to get that out of the way. No, yeah, something, I mean, guys, something that Doug. Now go ahead, Andy. No, I'm sorry. I think we got a little bit of a delay here. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to jump on you there, Ken. It, 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 he's absolutely right. Bread and circuses. This is the Roman Empire, uh, all over again. It's the Roman Empire. Throw the Russians in there, like V said. But you know, they learned from their own demise, and they said, you know what? Let's turn the tables, and we'll do it to these people, and we'll just make sure. That you know we can keep the we'll keep the junk flowing in there. We'll keep the ball games on. We'll keep all the bread and circuses going, and, and we'll make sure that uh, you know half the population is on psychotropic drugs. Don't forget that part. Uh, yep. We'll make sure that everybody's good and doped up, and we'll do whatever. We'll we'll just run roughshod all over these people, and they're gonna they're gonna get hit by a freight train, and they're not even gonna know what happened. Absolutely. You know, D- Doug, what, what you had alluded to, you know, can people really be this stupid? Can they not see it? Let's go back 100, 100 and some odd, 10 years to 1907. Okay, there's a banking trust known as Knickerbocker. Nobody knows that it's going to go under. So it desperately calls on the biggest banker in, in, in New York City, and that's uh, J.P. Morgan, brings them over. Talks to J.P. Morgan. How can we figure this? Can it, you know where can I get financing? Da 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 da. J.P. Morgan, instead of finding a way to help them, J.P. Morgan decided to use this to drop rumors that Knickerbocker was going to go under. 
instantly causing a bank run. And the bank run was so bad and the fear was so bad, all because of a rumor, that the people who for, a, for nearly 200 years had fought against a central bank were at that time willing to accept the creation of a central bank. All because of one rumor. All because of the fear and panic of a bank, uh, of a bank holiday in that. Okay. Yeah, so you J- asked today. J.P. Morgan took a he took a page right out of uh, Rothschild's playbook with that whole rumor. Yeah, absolutely. Thing. Well, his well J.P. Morgan's father was an agent of Rothschild who came o- came over to the states. But that being aside, you were asking about. Let's go to 2000, 2008. Okay. I'm watching CNBC. And I see the CEO of Bear Stearns is on there. He says, we are well capitalized. We've got $26 billion, da 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 Okay. And then the, that very night, this guy calls into Jim Cramer. He says, you know what? I'm, I'm wondering, should I sell Bear Stearns? No, oh, don't sell Bear Stearns. That was a Wednesday. By Saturday, Bear Stearns was gone. By Monday, the bailouts were created. Okay. It happened that quick. That Same thing in 1907. Same thing in 2008. This is how quick it's going to be. We are looking at indicators. You know, you want to talk about indicators underneath, bubbling under the system, okay? A few years ago, there was a rise in the potential of a different type of trading currency, you know, the Liberty Dollar, the NoFed. Yep. And, of course, of course, it got, you know, it was getting rising in popularity, especially with the Ron Paul revolution going on. Here's a way to get rid of outside of the central bank fiat currency thing. Of course, the Fed slammed it. You know why the Fed slammed it? Because it was an internal currency. You you will not succeed trying to create a, an internal currency inside the U.S. Okay, the the apparatus, the state apparatus will destroy it. Now, what do they have? Out of nowhere, bubbling. Somebody creates a digital currency that has no sovereign control and has the potential for no inflation. Now, I don't I don't know and I don't think Bitcoin is going to end up being this this great whatever, but what it is is it's an indicator. The people want something. The mass consciousness, if you want to quote unquote use that, they're feeling it. They're looking, they're desperately grasping for something outside the system because they feel that, you know what? I can't work within the system. The voting voting booths don't work. The politicians are the same, you know. Uh, no matter who you vote in. So we need something completely outside the paradigm. Break the paradigm. And that's what Bitcoin is. And what it is is it's a potential. Whether Bitcoin actually comes to any true fulfillment, nobody knows at this point. But guess what? It's just been accepted by Overstock. It was accepted by gift card to be traded at Target. It's being accepted. Now here's something else. The stock markets. You know that the stock markets are are pretty much at their peak when Wall Street starts creating different types of bond funds that are so out of the norm they're ridiculous. And in the last <laughs> last 3 months we have seen Fortress create a Bitcoin bond fund. We have seen uh oh who was it? Uh, it was on Merrill Lynch Merrill Lynch is creating a, a social impact bond fund for ex-convicts. You can invest on, in ex-convicts and get paid back depending on how they how they do in their jobs going future. In the, <laughs> oh, that sounds like a winner. <laughs> or Twitter. Twitter. You're investing in something that not only has not made a single dollar, but, is, but loses money, and it has no revenue stream already built in. Okay, when they're putting so much money into these things and creating these absurd type of funds, not to mention the derivatives, but these absurd type of funds, you know that investing in any company is absolutely worthless. They've either maxed out their their potential or there is so much money in play, they don't know what to do with it. So instead, they're going to take $600 million dollars and by art that probably, in reality, was only worth about $200 million. Right. Well, and this exactly. is even permeated into the stock market. <clears throat> you just take a look at that whole thing with Twitter. I mean, they've, they've never made money. And, you know, they're worth how many? Hundreds of billions of dollars? I don't even keep track of the stock well, price. $128 billion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for a company that never made a dime, doesn't contribute a thing, produces nothing. 
I mean, that's it's it's, it's the same idea, you know, as these ex-con bond funds and and everything else. I mean, it's it's a well, joke. Well, well, you see, Andy, the, the 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 trendies will look at you and tell you that you just don't get it, Andy. <laughs> no, I know, I know. I misunderstood. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I remember years ago when the uh, dot com bubbles were starting, and I and uh, a gentleman came up to me. A couple of guys are like, "Look, you got to invest in this company. It's uh, so and so dot com. It's worth seventy five million dollars." Wait, like, how is it worth seventy five million? Does, what do you guys make? <laughs> we sell natural products. <laughs> I'm like, this is the kind of chicanery. Okay, now this transcends into banking. Yeah, you know, I talked about. Uh, earnings being the driver of the market. How the heck, at the end of 2013, then when J.P. Morgan announces its profit earnings, there's a bank riddled with $74 trillion in derivative debt, and they posted a 33% profit gain from the prior, from the previous year. How is that possible? Okay? And again, it's, it's, it's accounting gimmicks. That's what they did. They started to write down their loan loss reserves. Basically, a loan loss is basically, you know, if you if you, you have a reserve, just in case you have X amount of loans out there and a certain percentage, you know, defaults. You have a loan reserve. The higher your loan reserve, the lower your profits and vice versa. So what JP did is they just started writing down their loan reserves. And voila, just like magic, they're showing a 33% gain from the last year. Folks, this is the nonsense that's going on. How can you invest when the numbers are so skewed, when there's no valuations that can be done? How can you invest in any company? <laughs> you know, and, and then you tell people, get gold, get silver, get platinum. You know, hold it tight because you're, you're, you're about to enter a storm. This is what's going to keep you afloat, and they look at you like you're crazy. And you can, if you guys want to. Well, uh, if I can just interject something here. Um, oh, God. This is this is kind of out of the. Uh, uh, this is going back to what we talked about earlier, and I know we covered a lot of ground since then. But a, a listener asked this, and and I'll, I'll you know what? I, I guess I've got the same question. Um, you talked about the gold at fifty thousand dollars. I just, for, for whatever reason, I just can't get that out of my head. Uh, you know, I can't wrap my brain around that. I've heard it said, by the way. Gold will at some point reach five thousand dollars an ounce, but that's a world in which you don't want to exist or live. And and I can see what that that statement refers to. What about silver? Um, and I know this is kind of a trite question, but where do you where do you folks uh, see silver rising to in relation to gold? Well, I'll say that uh, one. I mean, I think, uh, I think we've got uh, a really good opportunity for silver because. Silver is is nice, you know. In the, the respect that, first of all, you know, if, if I mean, let's be honest here. You know, let's let's not mince words. This world that we're talking about, we really haven't gotten to this yet, and I'm guessing we probably will. And Joe and Doug, I know you guys talk about this a lot, you know, especially with all the stuff that's going on with the government arming itself to the teeth. I mean, what is Main Street going to really look like when this whole thing goes down and this all takes place? Silver is a nice metal because the average person who doesn't have a whole bunch of money can get a decent amount of it and, and, and do okay. Also, you can get U.S. coins and you know, official U.S. good old quarters, half dollars, dimes, whatever, and they're 90% metal. Everybody recognizes that. That, that can be a currency for you, you know, in the stopgap between this whole – uh, situation, you know, when we switch over, when this whole thing goes down and takes place. Uh, another thing about silver that's very interesting is it, it gets used. It, it doesn't get mined, uh, minted into coins, bars, what have you, and then stored. Uh, it, it gets used. It's used in medicine, industry. Uh, it's used all over the world, so it gets consumed. Uh, it's in, and a lot of that's not able to be recycled. And the last I heard from uh, a geologist friend of mine who, who keeps track of these sorts of things, he said at current mining rates, we had, and this was probably about a year ago, he thought about anywhere between six and eight years worth of silver left. And, and this was, of course, notwithstanding somebody finding a, a significant uh, supply somewhere, another a new discovery. 
Um, so I, I think that the dynamic with silver is multifaceted. Yeah, it gets burned up, but it's a nice, you know, it's a poor man's gold, and it's something that can be used by people on the street in a situation where we get into this whole thing like, well, Walker, okay, the dollar's not worth anything anymore. What are we going to trade? We need something that has intrinsic value, and and you know that that's going to be something that can can kind of stand in there and and function that way. That's, that's how I'm seeing it. And, and that makes sense to me. And, and you know, I, I hate to keep dwelling on this because I know this is pretty short-sighted, but uh, I'll ask this anyway: gold or silver rounds versus the silver eagles difference. No, yes, doesn't matter. Um, Andy, I'll ask you first. I would say in that kind of an environment, probably doesn't matter too much. Uh, right now, you know, you might run into somebody saying, well, I've never heard of you know, XYZ minting and so forth. Uh, I want something that's recognizable. I want a philharmonic. I want a, a maple leaf. I want an eagle. Uh, that kind of environment, not necessarily sure that matters quite as much, but you know, I, I generally try to tell people if you're going to buy these coins, buy buy the ones that are recognizable. Uh, you know, buy buy you know, you know, if you're going to buy gold, buy Krugerrands or uh, you know, eagles, maple leaves, you know, these these types of things, you know, British sovereigns. Uh, you know, try to try to stay with things that that people are going to be more likely to recognize. Usually the rounds are, you know, a buck or so less per coin. Uh, that's to me. That's it, it's worth the extra buck. Uh, that's gotcha. kind of where I come at gotcha. it from. All right, it, it, Ken. Any thoughts on that or or? Yeah, it's, it's all perception. It's all perception. I saw this on TV once. I can't remember what show, but there was a guy <laughs> during. Uh, it may have been RT was doing it a little expo. They had a guy out uh, on the street for an hour. He had a fifty dollar Krugerrand, or a fifty dollar gold uh, silver eagle. I, I guess it's not fifty dollars. Yeah, that, that was fifty dollars silver yep. uh, gold eagle, and he tried to get people to pay him fifty dollars for it. Now the thing yeah. is worth was worth at the time fifteen hundred, but nobody would buy it. They didn't know what gold was. They didn't know what the cost was. They they had no concept. Even though it said fifty dollars on it in denomination, they didn't want anything to do with it. That's gonna be the problem. Okay. Silver rounds, my guess is this. Any of the, the high-end um, businesses that still uh, are functional, you know, when, when things start really hitting the fan and anybody comes out of the, uh, out of the dust, any of those uh, businesses that are going to be functional, they're going to know about <clears throat> silver. They're going to recognize it or they're going to have a means to be able to determine if something is silver or not. Because most of them, you know, in the 1930s Germany, in the Weimar, guess what? The people knew gold. The people knew silver. Yeah. Okay? They knew it and recognized it because they had to, even though they had used fiat currency for 20 years. Okay? But they recognized and remembered it, and they, they quickly saw the value in it. That's what's going to happen to businesses. You're going to walk in there and say, okay, you may have a digital credit card so they can't see the cash, or they're going to see cash, but if they see the silver and gold, and this is something else to remember, uh, Doug, you know, trying to grasp, grasp around the, the price that I, I threw out there and Sinclair threw out there. Okay, the world's going to be in a completely different paradigm. You're thinking 50000 U.S. dollars in today's world. Okay, when that is valued at a comparison to today, the world's going to be completely different. You're going to have a different perspective and see things differently. The whole monetary system is going to be different. It's going to be as different as when 1933, when people used to use a gold coin and silver coins in regular, regular shopping, to having it all confiscated. Now you've got bills, and then, you know, learning the paradigm of just dealing with Federal Reserve notes starting in '71, et cetera, et cetera. This is going to be a shift. This is going to be a shift. At the very beginning, people are going to be confused. They're going to be angry. They're going to be whatever. But then they'll easily they'll get digested into it because that's what humanity does. Okay, and, so and I, when and I, I get say that. fifty thousand, when I say fifty thousand dollars now, in relation, it may only be two thousand dollars in a new devalued currency. But your spending power would be the equivalent of fifty thousand dollars today. Got it. And, and and folks, please get that. Uh, I know if I 
I have a hard time understanding that, but perhaps others do as well. V, I'm going to ask you this. Um, uh, confiscation. Do you, by the way, that question I asked about the uh, co- uh, price of uh, gold and silver, that perhaps, anytime we have a show like this, that is the number one question that yeah. we get by email. But, but V, uh, what about gold, or gold and silver confiscation like under Roosevelt? Impossible? Uh, expected? No? What do you think? I mean, uh, anything is possible. Uh, th- that's number one. Number two, got to understand a couple of things. I, I also want to touch uh, really quickly on the whole silver issue uh, and, and metals issue on, in a collapsed environment. Uh, one thing is this. You know, luckily, we do have historical examples. Okay, uh, n- number one was uh, during World War II uh, when you had Jewish refugees that were fleeing Germany. One of the things they've had were their silver menorahs, their silver dreidels, their you know religious, uh, you know uh, um, you know plates and things of that sort that were all 100% silver. They were able to pawn that at the border crossing that allowed them to escape Germany, uh, you know, and 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 pay their way through. Uh, there's always in a collapsed environment uh, a way. There will always be individuals and businesses that have a way to determine whether you have real silver or real gold or you don't. Okay. And at the end of the day, in a collapsed environment, it's all about melt value. And we've also seen this in Argentina. Uh, when they when the Argent, when Argentina went down, uh, they've had, of course, a handful of foreign currencies, but also people that were able to leave were able to, you know, pay their way through gold and silver and, and, and those types of means. Uh, now, that being said, uh, onward to, to confiscation of precious metals. <clears throat> One thing also you have to understand is this. When you have a collapsed uh, economically collapsed environment, you have what? A broke government that doesn't function that well. And the aspect of is that, that does function will be the security apparatus. Now, if the security apparatus works, you have a limited amount of manpower. So logistically speaking, it's going to be very difficult for them to go door-to-door and start get, you know, confiscating people's metals. I really don't see that happening. It's too much of a pain. But at the same, at the same time, I tell my clients, you know, if you're going to keep uh, gold and silver in your house, excuse me, you know, get creative with it. You know, you get, you know, so I have clients of mine that hide it in floorboards, uh, electrical outlets, uh, things of that sort. Some bury it in the backyard. Uh, this, this, whether you know you have a, a foreign troop knocking on your door, or you have some armed robber trying to come through your door. It's just good. It's just a good, prudent thing to do. But the most likely targets in a collapse would be the depositories, the Delaware depositories, yeah. depositories in Nevada, depositories in California. That those have already been signed off. They, you know, when the crap hits the fan, they're going to go there, and then they're going to hit the bank uh, safe deposit boxes. Those are going to be the first two for confiscation. And all right, if the you. government and if the government goes ahead and says, Oh, you can't use gold and silver, all they're gonna do is just create a massive black market. Look what's happening in India. Every step that the government does, saying, Okay, you gotta limit gold purchases to X amount, all that's doing is creating a ravenous black market which every month is growing by leaps and bounds. I mean we look, I have family in the Middle East. Uh, in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi, and also in you know, and all, all over, you know, I got a family pretty much every every continent and every country in the world. And I hear about these about the Indians that get on the planes, and they literally have uh, <laughs> you know a couple ounces of gold bars and, and and coins in their pockets as they travel, you know, because they they are part of the whole you know black market, you know, they they're bringing it into the country because there's a ravenous appetite. In the East, they understand the value of hard assets. They understand the value of land. They understand the value of cattle. They understand the value of chickens. They understand the value of how many coconut trees uh, and rubber uh, plantations and rice paddies you own. These are valuables to them. They understand gold has a value to it. So they're heavily invested. They have a ravenous appetite for hard assets. Us Americans, we have a ravenous appetite for for stupidity, and what I mean by that is we we buy things that we don't need. Uh, we have a ravenous appetite for the newest app. We have a ravenous appetite for the latest reality show. 
We have the uh, ravenous appetite for the new latest fashion handbag. I mean, this is what goes on, folks. So the rest of the world's prepared. They're ready, and they're waiting this dollar collapse. Uh, meanwhile, we're just, uh, you know, most Americans are sitting around twiddling their thumbs. Uh, Ken or Andy? Yeah, I'll, I, throw, I'll throw... I'll in there. Oh, go ahead, Ken. I'm, okay, uh, yeah, I'll throw, I'll throw a couple on. things in there. Um, remember, Doug, in uh, 1933, when they did the confiscation, okay, they never went door to door. Okay, we had a, we had a society that the people trusted their government. A lot of them didn't, but there was still the majority. Okay, the second thing was, what do you think the bank holiday was for? Bank holiday was for two weeks. It wasn't just to stop people from taking money out. It was to give them time to go through all the uh, safety deposit boxes and take what they wanted. That's what it was. Okay, that's what when you see a bank holiday coming through. You know, frankly, when it comes to, since almost every, everything is digital, if, if a, a bank run was going on, the Fed, if it wanted to, could quickly provide funds electronically to any bank out there that's part of the FDIC system. So that's a misnomer as well because the Fed's got, you know, enough money, especially since, since the majority of banks that have borrowed from the discount window have actually put the money back on deposit in the Fed. <laughs> so that being said, but here, here's another aspect of it. If we go to this, if, if China does take dominion, uh, China hegemony, and they have the international gold-backed trade note, okay, the United States government is probably going to be more apt to buy gold from the people, offering them, them a, you know, a good price at the currency, because the U.S. is desperately going to need gold to be able to actually do any trade. Right. Yeah, I don't think there's going to be a a confiscation of door to door, and I, 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 V is right. There's not going to be enough manpower. Secondly, another you know to extend on what Ken said, you were looking at a people in 1933 that were used to using gold as a currency, and they were just being told basically, all right, you know what, we're switching over to a new currency. They kind of went along with it. I don't think a lot of them really, I mean, I'm sure some of them did, but most of them, by and large, okay, all right, whatever, uh, we'll go along with it. Today, what do pe why do people in this country, and, and it's a very small portion when you consider the, the population of this country and the number of people who own precious metals, why do they buy them? They buy them for protection, and they buy them as a way to escape the dollar. Those people are going to be so less apt to just willingly hand it over. Uh, they're they're going to want something, and there's not going to be the power to just grab it, I don't think. So, you know, the idea of confiscation, yeah, if it's in a depository, it's probably gone. If it's in a safety deposit box, yeah, it's probably gone. If you get a little bit creative and you be a little bit smart about the whole thing, chances are pretty good, I think, you're going to be able to hang on to it. Absolutely. And since we're on the uh, subject of confiscation, guys, you know, let's talk about 2014 and the coming bail-ins. Let's talk about the biggest bill ever to be signed into law, and that's uh, 30,000 pages of Dodd-Frank. Let's, let, let's talk about that. Yeah, oh, yeah, Dodd-Frank. Yeah, it's interesting. January 1st, 2014, it is now, uh, what is it, bank deposits are considered liabilities to the bank and can be used to as collateral to capitalize the bank because they are not considered primary uh primary shareholders, primary bondholders. They will if they get if they get paid back, they're going to be second or third or fourth down the line. Yeah, you're right. no longer a depositor anymore. You know, you go into the bank, you put your paycheck in the bank, you think, "Hey, I've got all this protection. It's safe." I'm fine, everything's hunky-dory, no, 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 no. No, you're an unsecured creditor now, and like Ken said, you're third, fourth in line. That that bank goes under, you get converted from being a, a creditor to a shareholder, and the shares are probably worth not even the paper they're printed on, and they won't be printed on paper anyway. So you're going to get cleaned out, and right. that is the bail-in right there. Absolutely. And I mean, you look at the... Uh the April 2012 IMF review, you know, that policy, 
And I think what it was basically stating is that the uh, statutory bail-in powers intended to achieve a prompt recapitalization and restructuring of a distressed institution. And it's basically like in the case of resolving any kind of distressed, globally active, systemically important financial institution or the GSIFI, you know, um, and and that's what people need to understand. It, it, it's already lit, written into law. The FDIC, the Bank of England, the IMF, they're all on board with it. Um, it, it it's it's going to be unbelievable. I mean, you you look at the uh, uh, look at just the, the the six biggest banks in the United States. I mean, they spent over thirty billion dollars, billion, lobby. to lobby Congress to pass this law. They had close to five thousand lobbyists chasing every single congressman. That's like what three and a half lobbyists to to uh, to every congressman. I mean, it's insane, folks. Just so they can get this thing passed, you know, it's it, you know, it's 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 this is not a. Uh, any sort of a haircut. This is a decapitation, of, of a financial decapitation. And, and like what Andy said, you, you're, you're just a, a creditor. You become a shareholder. And and you're a shareholder. You're, gonna, you, you're not going to get that money right away. You're going to sit there for years until they dictate what the capitalization is, until they dictate what the price of that sh stock would be, and then eventually you'll get a couple of pennies on the dollar. That's it. It's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, this isn't this isn't a this isn't a uh, they're not sending a barber. They're sending the guillotine. Yes. Yes. You know, so, <laughs> something else even even if you don't I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Doug. No. Yeah, okay. So, so just to be, I guess I missed the memo on this. The Dodd-Frank Act. That was quite a while ago, right? I I mean that, that that was determined back in the uh in, in the nineties, correct? Or is this something new that that uh, is uh two thousand ten. Two thousand ten. Yeah, it's, it's a post they, uh... crash post crash uh new financial outlay. It's like Glass okay. Eagle, only on the wrong Reverse. side of the ledger. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. For some reason, I, I was thinking that this Dodd Frank Act uh, uh, came into play back in the Clinton administration or during the Clinton administration. But perhaps I'm obviously I'm wrong. Uh, but, but, but what I hear you saying here is, um, well, you have VU and Steve and others have talked about this. We 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 take our money, put it in the bank, and at some moment, at, at a given time of their choosing, they could confiscate all of that money or part of that money because it's a liability to them. We're an unsecured creditor to them. We're fourth or fifth or sixth, whatever, down the line. Um, but that, that this is what you're saying clearly, right? I, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not mishearing you. Right, absolutely. Yeah, think of MF Global. Think of MF, MF Global. Segregated accounts are considered unfunded liabilities of the, of the institution, and they can sequester that money to use as they see fit under this guise and promise, just like the FDIC guise and promise, of paying it back in some other form at some other time that they choose. All right. Oh, okay. I, I, I got that. But, but and, Doug, why? That, that's, all part, that's all part of the orderly liquidation authority that the FDIC receives because of Dodd-Frank. And that's when Andy highlighted that you're just a fourth party, you're just a, right. a shareholder, and and that's you know that's what this whole thing is about. It, it, it's now they have teeth to go ahead and 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 confiscate and leave you holding the bag. Okay. You know, it's yeah, like, yeah. It's like wow. this, it may, maybe we can make a, a quick analogy here to help people understand this because if there's one thing, well, there's a lot of things to take away from from tonight, but if there's one thing in the, in the last ten minutes. Uh, it, 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 instead of depositing your paycheck or you know, having it auto deposited by by your employer, think of it as having them auto deposit into a brokerage account and buying stock in your bank. The only difference is the stock's worth next to nothing, and you might not be able to do anything with it for a period of years, potentially, right. if that bank becomes unstable. And let's not forget who dictates what the definition of unstable is. <laughs> you know, when they want to do this, all they have to do is is have some stress test or, or or some other kind of you know false financial flag you know event, 
and say, you know, another 2008, something like that. All of a sudden, you know, all these banks, the big six, whatever, they're unstable. You're bailed in. You're done. Goose is cooked. Over. Yeah, and just remember, Doug, Beautiful. it's not just the United States that, that did this. Last year, going into last year, starting here, Canada did it. As a matter of fact, it's yeah. now part of their normal banking policy. Uh, the the Eurozone is has already prepared because they were the one who t- uh, tested it in Cyprus, and they're prepared yes. to do uh, to all of the Southern Europe. Uh, New Zealand, I believe, Australia, all of these have implemented new policies putting bank deposits at uh, in in this category. Now, here's something else. Take, we'll put the bail in aside for a moment. Okay, we're entering into the taper. Well, there was something that came out in the FOMC minutes from uh, from last September, I believe. No, November. Um, the FOMC was talking about bringing in the taper as soon as December, but probably in January, which they ended up doing or are going to do. And one of the things that the banks do with a lot of their money is they keep it on account in what's known as the interest rate or excessive reserve, the IOER, inside the Federal Reserve. And the Fed mm-hmm. pays them uh, a quarter of a point uh, interest for for holding that money. Well, one of the things that the in the little known in the FOMC minutes was that the Fed is, if it starts to taper, is considering lowering or removing interest on those ex- excess reserves to zero, which means offset. It's a way to offset the implied tightening that's going to come from from the you know tapering QE. Well, the banks. Who were who talked to the Fed about this warned that should the Fed lower the IOER uh, interest rate to zero, they would be forced to start charging depositors. Yep. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> that's absolutely crazy. Uh, so, so, so they can exercise again, if I'm hearing this correctly, a right of offset in such a way. Okay, plus charging people to deposit. Their money in the Absolutely. bank. Absolutely. Uh, well, is, so at this point, it, gentlemen, I, I mean, I, just from what you said, and I know we've got so much more to get into, but just from what you said, uh, especially with uh, with the uh, Jim uh, or uh, uh, John Williams from Shadow Stats, did, did I get that right, uh, John Williams? Yes. Shadow Stats. Okay. All right. Uh, it's got when we reach a negative or a zero sum benefit here at, at some point in the middle of the year or even before that, this thing's got to stop. The Ponzi scheme has got to got to collapse. Is I, I, I I'm trying. I I can't think of any other way around this. Timing wise, anyway. Well, the, the Ponzi scheme has already been exposed. Uh, what the rest of the world is doing, the Chinese and the Russians. Is uh they're they're quietly exiting, okay? They're they they left the party a while ago, and they're just making sure that their structure is set up so that when this whole thing does go down, that they're they're not going to be left holding the bag um, for this whole entire party. Uh, okay. That's one thing people have to understand is that the, the scheme is exposed. The only person that's buying into this Ponzi scheme is the average American. That's it. The Asians have woken up to it. Okay, the, the 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 Russians have woken up into it, and they understand, and they're moving away from the dollar. Uh, you know, oftentimes people don't understand this, but when you have one of the heads over at Forex coming forward and, and stating how great it is that China is setting up a currency swap with the Europeans, bypassing, and here's here's the word that they used, bypassing the volatile dollar. You know, that made the hairs on my the back of my neck stand up because. There was never a time when the word volatile and dollar was put together. Never. Okay? Never. So when you have one of the tops at the largest foreign exchange in the world saying dollar and volatile, that's that's a huge, huge statement, folks, because there was a time when the dollar was as good as gold. Now they're saying volatility and dollar in the same sentence. So they get it. Okay? Financial firms all over the world get it. They're just waiting for this drunken sailor to collapse, and that's us. So, the, so they can move on with this with this coming global reset. Um, Andy, you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean that's exactly what's happening. I mean, we we've got this idea 
here in America that we have this cloak of immunity because of the dollar standard, the petrodollar, uh, the reserve currency status. We think that we can just go out there and just borrow as much money as we want spend as much money as we want, and basically do whatever we want, and there's never a piper to be paid. There's never a reckoning day for any of this stuff. We, we, we are still you know, getting back to the paradigm thing. That's the paradigm that the average American is in. We can just do whatever we want financially. And you know, if, if, we, if we, we blow it, hey, the government's there. They'll take care of us. That's our mentality. And that will end swiftly. And talk about, you know, you know, when this whole thing goes down, another aspect of this, what about all those people that aren't in the workforce that are depending on transfer payments from a government that doesn't have anything to transfer? <laughs> you know, that's another whole, another whole slice of this thing that has to be considered. And that's, that's why, you know, I get back to what I said before. What is main? What is your average Main Street USA going to look like when this all transpires? And I'm not sure that any one of us can fully get our heads around that. Like Walmart on a on a Black Friday, perhaps you know? Yeah, uh, on steroids, maybe. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. And perhaps that's what the bullets, uh, the, the ammunition is for. But you know, I, I cannot see anything good coming out of this. Uh, one question that uh, both Joe and I have here in the studio is: What is going to come after this? This global reset? Uh, it, will this be a global currency? Uh, v, go ahead. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna let uh, Ken tackle that one. Uh, go ahead, Ken. I know you have, you have some things to say about that. You know, nothing's written in stone, you guys. But all indications from those who really are in the know and are looking at all the different aspects is it's not a currency per se. It's a trade note. Okay. I think I think the stigma of a currency for international trade will have really put a bad taste in so many people's mouths, especially for the fact, here's the difference, okay? If there is a reserve currency, that reserve currency can I export inflation everywhere. If you yeah. have a, a trade note, then everything is based on a balanced equal asset, i.e. gold, so there's no inflation or deflation to begin with. Gold is set at the same price, and so no matter if the trade is done across from point to point, the value is always remains the same. So that's where I think it's going to be, is currencies are going to are forever, or at least for the next phase of humanity's global financial system, currencies are going to remain domestic and internal. There's going to be a gold-backed trade note that's going to be pretty much inflation-free that's going to be done around the world. I don't know. What are you guys' thoughts? Well, I think uh, that's the uh, that's the uh, the power struggle right there. You know, you 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 have a large contingent that wants an internationally uh, gold-backed trade note, and you and you have the old Anglo-American power structure that's still cram clamoring for a world reserve currency and, and fiat paper and 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 all the the trappings that go along with that. So it's going to be pretty interesting to see. That's why you know you also have the uh, you know, the, the concept of the uh, the SDR, uh, the, the you know the special drawing rights. Uh, we've had uh, a couple of um, uh, what is it called? A couple of con uh, conceptual plans put out there using Amaro. the Bancor. Oh uh, yeah, the uh, the Bancor uh, running off yeah. the uh, basket of currencies. You know, so right now it's going to be pretty interesting. You know, right now the uh, what's going to come out on top as the winning system. Is going to be pretty pretty interesting. But that being said, I will tell you right now, and you know, some people out there, oh, he's you know talking about the Chinese and the Russians. He, he must love the Chinese and the Russians. No, I don't love I don't love them. I, you know, I'm an American. I, I love America. Uh, I love what she was. You know, uh, the greatest freest country the world's ever seen. I hate what she's become. But that being said, the East holds all the cards. They have all the hard assets. So. If I'm talking about leveraging and power, I think there's a very strong 
uh, component, uh, you know, barring any unforeseen event, I could see the East coming out and 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 really uh, putting uh, the foundation down on a on a on a gold backed international trade paper. And that's also the reason why the whole BRICS bank is being set up in the first place. It's expressly for the uh, the gold backed trade paper. You know that that that's what you know that's what this whole thing is about. So there's there's definitely a major paradigm shift that's going away from America. I mean, look at how many nations, even with the internet, with this whole NSA spying thing that's, that's blown up on <laughs> on Obama again. Uh, you have the world that want that wants to get away not only from the dollar but also from a U.S. centric internet. So there's a lot of 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 power. You have the new uh, wealth, the new guard versus the old guard. So it's going to be pretty interesting to see what transpires. It's hard to pick at the moment. Uh, Andy, you want to add? I'm going to go with you. I'm going to say, and I'll, I'll take it a step further. I'm, I'm putting, uh, I don't know, my international gold back trade notes on the East at this point, just because of what you said. They've got the tickets. They've got they've got the assets. They've got the tangibles. Uh, they've got the alliances. They're creating more alliances. They've got the bank that they've set up. The whole infrastructure is there. Now, they, what they don't have, and this could be their Achilles heel right now, is what you just said. They don't have that separate communications system set up yet. That could be an issue, and you know that might be something that we're going to have to keep an eye on and see how they how they decide to approach that are they going to create their own quote internet uh, are they going to you know remain on this one and try and try and boot the NSA out that that's going to be an interesting struggle that might be one marker that we still kind of have our our, our our fingers on a little bit uh, you know obviously we've got you know military assets here and there although I think they're becoming a little less relevant uh, these days uh, you know, sign Pakistan. Use that as an example. Uh, but I, I think this is going to this is leaning heavily towards the east at this point. I think they're going to end up with their their trade note, and it, it's it will be eventually perverted like everything else is. Uh, but starting out, it'll be a pretty it'll be a pretty decent system. You'll have a, a fungible system of trade for even the small players because. Uh, you know, of the pricing, the way gold is, is going to be priced, you know, as Ken was talking about before. Uh, it, the currencies will be internal, so you won't really have Forex, per se. You won't have those those battles going on, uh, you know, these devaluation wars. Uh, you won't have to worry about that. You'll have something, uh, a, a rock foundation of value to base things on, which we don't have right now. We don't have anything that has concrete value. And that's that's one of the biggest things our financial system is lacking. And I, I think the East has the solution at this point for, for creating that, at least in the you know, the short to medium term. Like I said, eventually I think they'll end up abusing it just like every other currency system and eventually gets abused. But uh going forward I, I think they've got they've got the inside track. Gentlemen, we are at the top of the hour. Please hold your thoughts. The perils of preoccupation by the American proletariat, perhaps this could be entitled, this show titled uh, that. Uh, folks, we're a very special show tonight. We're joined by V, the guerrilla economist who's seated at the head of the dais, as well as Ken Shortchen and Andy Sutton. Folks, all of their websites are hard linked directly off of homelandsecurityus.com. Uh, what an interesting program! What a what a dynamic uh, what a dynamic forum that we have tonight. I want to thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report on this, the 10th day of January 2014. We're going to be back here in about four minutes, right after these brief messages. Stay with us once again with Ken Shortchen. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the third and final hour of the Hagman and Hagman Report on this Friday. January 10th, 2014. I don't know what's going on with the audio there during that commercial break. I hear the volume fluctuating, um, and uh, some of the people in the chat room were saying that the commercials were rather loud, and I apologize for that. Uh, a few announcements, then we're going to get right back in with our guests, uh, V, the Grill Economist, Ken Shorgen, and Andy Sutton. Um, Paul McGuire will be joining us on Wednesday, January 15th, for the whole show, and following the next day, uh, Michael Arevna 
will be on with us, and he is going to be joined by uh, a, a lady who has a, a testimony to give. And I talked with him a little bit today, and uh, I have not talked with the woman yet, but from what I heard of him, it's going to be a, a great show, uh, and that will be Thursday the 16th. Also, don't forget, Brother Marcus has a new radio show with his son, Curtis, Pine Ridge Warriors, right here on Blog Talk Radio, every Saturday night, 7 p.m. Mountain Time, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, make sure you guys follow him and, and give him support, as uh, it is a, a great new show and they are preaching and uh, giving their testimony and what they know and what they've learned and sharing that with everybody. And uh, they just started this as a new new thing. Pine Ridge Warriors, uh, every Saturday night, 9 Eastern, 7 Mountain Time. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. All right, we are going to come right back now. We have some questions from the listeners. Um, we uh, have questions about Glass-Steagall. We have questions about the uh, mini crash and i guess we could start here and i know you guys got into the, the stock market the i remember the, i think the last time you were on uh, and you had an article up on your website that talked about the a mini crash and as this mini crash happened you were explaining how the prices of metals would not go up or show their their the value that they would be and especially it surprised me especially during something um, like a stock market crash or a flash crash or mini crash what would cause the metals to, to stay down is it the same manipulation we've been seeing or would they have to pull out some new tricks uh, to keep that manipulation going well you know it's, it's definitely going to be the, the manipulation is, is, is going to be there but you know that being said a couple of things has changed the game a little bit, uh, you know, since I mentioned that, what, couple, some major events have occurred. Uh, number one, you have one of the master manipulators decided to pack up and and leave the playground, and that's uh, J.P. Morgan. They no longer, no, you know, want to be part of uh, the. You know, they're getting rid of the commodities business. They they're, they want out of commodities. Okay. And on top of that, their skyscraper here in New York, they're selling that, and the vault where that had their. Uh, that, that held their silver. They're, they're, they're selling that as well. And both those things are going to the Chinese. All right, so goodbye, J.P. Morgan. Good to know you. It was sweet, but uh, have a good one. Uh, second thing was uh, Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank's getting out of commodities. Okay, third thing, you have uh, Goldman Sachs. Uh, they're, they're winding down their commodity business as well. These are just some of the master manipulators at work. And this time around, these guys are gone. Now, in terms of uh, an absolute crash, when you talk about a stock market crash, you're talking about all tickers, all indicacies, pretty much frozen in the United States. Uh, and in that context is what I was talking about. Uh, you know, you're not going to see the metals prices rising uh, over here uh, in, in a crash because of the fact that all the indexes in the market here are going to be shut down. Uh, there, it's going to be another thing abroad, you know, once they feel the initial shock and then they recover from that shock of a dollar collapse, uh, you know, then you'll see those tickers in gold and silver absolutely moonshot uh, right through this, you know, right into the into the stratosphere. You know, that's what you'll see. Okay. Mm. Yeah. These. Uh, uh, were you were you gonna jump in? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. These uh, s uh, scenarios that we're talking about tonight, um, none of them seem to have a, a happy ending for the average Joe out there, the average small business owner, the average uh, person out there making, you know, whatever the income might be. We're seeing the middle class be plunged. Uh, what do you make of the new job market or the new uh, unemployment numbers? I think the, the latest oh. that was 6.7%, and then you see the headlines on Dredge, the record, almost 92 million people are, are out of the, the, work, the workforce. Yeah, I'm glad you uh, brought that up because that was going to be the next thing that I was going to post to uh, Ken and Andy over here. Uh, because, uh, I mean, you got to love it, folks. 92 million Americans permanently out of the workforce. 52 million on food stamps. Another 90 million getting some sort of assistance. And 101 million on welfare. Uh, let's talk about the jobless rate. And I guess we could go from the joblessness. And we can talk to, uh, I guess, you know, me, uh, Andy, and Ken. We've kind of, uh, you know, we're going to have to nominate this person as the person of the year for 2014. I guess we'll close out with Janet Yellen. But, uh, 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 Andy, you want to talk about those uh, job numbers real quick? 
let's just go back here uh, it was a while ago, and the Fed set their target for the end of the taper. You guys remember that? They yep, yep. Five, 5% six, and 6%. Six, yeah, <laughs> 6.5 was thrown in there, too, uh, yes. as, a, as a possible number. So we're, we're getting right up here uh, to the time where, you know, this is going to start to kick in. But, you know, the important thing to notice for, for the people, because this, you don't hear this on the mainstream for the most part, that unemployment rate didn't go down because we created a bunch of jobs. It went down because a bunch of people dropped out of the workforce. There's a big difference. We have more and more people. Food stamps, I don't even know how many months it is consecutively now that subscription to that program has increased. Uh, record high after record high after record high. I lost track. Uh, all these, these, these social support programs, these quote-unquote great society dinosaurs from the 1960s have been stressed, stressed, and stressed to the point where they're, you know, they're, they're about ready to break. The job market isn't getting better. This is Bernanke's legacy. Go back to 2009. You remember he got in front of Congress and with unmitigated gall said, we are going to have a jobless recovery. Do you guys remember that? That is Absolutely. the only thing that that guy said that has been spot on. They knew this was the plan. This is not an accident. This is not some, oh, well, we made a policy error. No, you didn't make a policy error. You knew exactly what was going to happen. And, you know, this, this whole idea of giving these guys a free pass because they're idiots, they're incompetent, they're bumbling morons, Maybe that applies to some of the folks in the legislature uh, and, and those around the country at the various state levels. It does not apply to these power brokers. They know exactly what they are doing. Absolutely. Uh, if I can ask, uh, v, and I ask this all the time, uh, you've heard me ask this before, but, but I really want to list the names, man. I, I want to know who to go after um, it, when when everything collapses, when families are, are homeless when children are without food when when this when the United States of America is turned into a third world country where do where do we start <laughs> and I'm being serious I'll, I'll, I'll mail you a list <laughs> how about that <laughs> I'll, I'll mail you okay. a list I got a, I got a couple of lists I got to mail out All but right. uh, wow. here's the thing I mean you know truth be told I, I know some of these characters uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, sources of mine that, that are also know what's going on, and they're very upset with what's going on because they're, they're, they're seeing the whole market being turned topsy-turvy, uh, being rigged and siphoned. And, look, it, it, it's not, you know, from a lot of the data that's coming out, you know, it, 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 it's not a, a far-conceived notion where you're going to have some, you know, disgruntled, uh, angry former military uh, commanders uh, getting together with a bunch of disgruntled, angry heads of uh, banking. And uh, names will be given and addresses will be given out, and uh, you're going to see some action. I and mean, maybe that's what they want. You know, maybe that's what they want. But um, it, it's not going to be pretty, you know. But, uh, you know, that being said, um, uh, Ken, do you want to add anything to that? <laughs> Well, you know, some of the interesting things when you take a look at the the unemployment numbers and how they relate to today, the fact is is that who is, you know, you have to look at from a social and an economic standpoint of who is Obama. He's a Marxist. Okay. Right. You have to look at who his masters are. Okay. They're the powers that be that want chaos to create a new order. So to... To worry about which politician, which Fed president, which you know person in the economy, et cetera, et cetera, is the one we should go after. The point is, is that they're all working cahoots for a specific goal. The specific goal is, after the crash of 2007, the, bu the housing bubble, everything has been put in motion to take as much wealth from America as possible because they deep down and they looked at the numbers and they discovered there is no going back. There is no reset. Okay? I think in 2008, especially when, when uh, 
Paulson threatened uh, the the House of Representatives that there would be martial law in the streets. They knew that there was no going back. You're talking you're talking institutions that had been around for a hundred years and had been through the Great Depression and had been through uh, the great turmoil of the '70s and all these you know different aspects. Mm-hmm. They fell. They fell instantly overnight. Okay, they knew that the jig is up, and so what they what this has been is it's been simply a kicking it the da- uh, can down the road. They've been borrowing money to make sure that everybody's got just enough welfare to eat and to have a place to stay, but not never never to get ahead. There's been no loans to to small businesses. There's been no uh, money put into growth by the corporations. You, know, you want to you want to know why the there, that for all the money that the Fed has printed, we haven't seen this massive inflation. That's usually one of the questions I get from people. Hey, if there's going to be hyperinflation, why don't we have mass inflation now? And it really has to get down to that that technical term called velocity of money. Yeah. Okay. The money is created, and normally velocity of money, to give a good definition of it, is. I have $100 and I need to replace a window in my store. So I go down to the glazier and I give him $100, he puts a window in, then the glazier needs to buy groceries, so he get, goes to the grocer and buys $100 and gives it to him, then the grocer needs Did we lose you? Hello? Uh, I think he dropped off. Uh, we'll get him Who back on that. Uh, Ken. Ken, you there, buddy? Uh, the- no, he, the the NSA it. must not have approved of his response. Uh, his definition, <laughs> v, uh, v or, or Andy, I, I, I noted you nodding in approval there um, for yeah. my spy cam. So, so Andy, if you want to go ahead and complete what Ken was saying. Well, how about yeah? How about if I finish his point? If I get kicked off, then then we kind of know what's going on here. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he's, he's exactly right. The velocity is basically. If you think about it from a business standpoint, inventory turnover, how fast the money moves through the system. And you take a look at M2 velocity, it is just, it's dropping. It's at at almost historic lows, if not historic lows. That's one of the real problems. They can't, all the the QE, all the trillions in commitments from the Fed, all the, the, the deficit borrowing and spending by the government, and they can't get the money to move, and that is one of the biggest problems of this whole this whole situation. And that, and you know, going back to to 2008, that whole thing was starting to develop then. And yeah, I think they saw the writing on the wall then, and they realized this whole thing is is up. You know, the the sword has been plunged into the dragon's heart, and death is imminent. But you know what? It's that tail that whips around as the dragon's dying, that sometimes gets here. And that, that's what we're dealing with right now. This thing is dying. This whole Anglo-American financial empire, if you will, is the, it's, going, it's dead. It's, it's dying. It's collapsing. And you got to get out of the way because it, it'll, take, it'll take you along with it, and, and it, it, it won't even think twice. Right. And, gentlemen, sorry to interrupt, but we do have Ken back with us. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to feed my phone's hamster. <laughs> <laughs> he probably di- he probably yeah. probably passed out, and I needed to give him some more food, you know. So, <laughs> you know these these new uh, I'm telling you these new digital um, we, we should have never switched from analog to digital, but uh, that's just my opinion. Well, well, V, now you were talking about um, Janet Yellen, excuse me, Janet Yellen yeah. coming in, and uh, we know we haven't covered that yet. Um, Bernanke. Uh, not my favorite guy, certainly, and uh, he's to me he's done a lot of damage. Uh, for number one, why did he bail, and, and then why Yellen? I guess, and, and then you why know, don't you go ahead and take it from there? Yeah, you know, one of the things that uh, that me and the me, me and Andy and Ken were talking about uh, prior in the week was Yellen. You know, what, what what was the whole what was the whole strategy of putting this person who has zero experience in banking, has been nothing but a paper-pushing academia in her whole life. She's married to a guy who's a Nobel Prize winner in economics because he wrote position papers demonizing the free market. Uh, why do they choose this woman? Okay, And the simple answer is this. I mean, you know, um, if you guys remember, 
I mean, who who were the front runners in the original? Who's going to be replacing Bernanke race? And it was you know the the first prominent name was Larry Summers. And uh, Ken made a point, and, and and he said that Larry Summers is like a fixer. And you know me being from New York, you got the whole you know mafia thing over here. Well, had. A fixer is somebody who goes out and, and fixes a crime scene. Now, if anybody's seen the movie Pulp Fiction, uh, the guy that shows up in an accurate NSX and cleans up the murder scene and acts like, you know, and gives everybody their alibi, that's a fixer. That's Larry Summers, okay? All of a sudden, Larry Summers, on a weekend, decides, eh, he doesn't want to be the Fed chair anymore. And then, you know, Yellen gets nominated. I want you to think about that for a second. You got Yellen, who is... What Andy said earlier it is a dove with condor-sized wings. G is a person who believes in lowering the unemployment rate by more QE. Okay, she's going to create QE to infinity uh, on steroids. She comes in and she does two things. Number one, she forever cements Bernanke's legacy and Greenspan's. So they're going to go untouched and untarnished as, as as the men who destroyed America's economy. So Yellen becomes the maid on the Titanic who's been given the navigational charts to go ahead and land the boat into the into into a couple more icebergs. And then you got Obama who's the chief bottle washer who's been called up to steer the damn thing. So that's the situation we have here and uh and Ken and Andy, any you guys want to expand on that, go ahead. Yeah, well uh Ye- Yellen, re- Yellen reminds me a lot of uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Okay, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson was just somebody who was in the system for a hundred years. You know, he was uh, Speaker of the House under FDR, and then of course he was, you know, got on with the Texas. But he had all the skeletons in the closet of everybody. Okay, so he uh, he gets into the presidency, and he didn't know what he was doing. And but and he tried to impose this new program, but Yellen I think is pretty much going to be the one who was put into office to for the collapse. And she was given the promise, You want to be Fed chairman? Well guess what? Here's the price you're gonna pay. And you are gonna be the one whose name will go down in history at the collapse. Why? I'll throw out something there too Why? about Janet Yellen. You go back there, she graduated from Yale University, 1971, Ph.D. You know, I want to know what her thesis was titled? Employment Output and Capital Appreciation in an Open Economy, a Disequilibrium Approach under the Supervision of James Tobin and Joe Stiglitz. Go figure. I mean, this this is Keynesianism, neo-Keynesianism, you know, to, to the end. Not short no, term, like we were talking about earlier. She's talking about Keynesianism ad nauseum. I mean, this, she's never seen an intervention or an interference that she hasn't liked. I mean, this, hey, Andy, the, the the fact that you know that Andy scares me. I don't know why, but it does. <laughs> that's a, that says how how much yelling, how long she's been there. She's been there forever. I mean, yeah. people like Bernanke were yanked out of out of university to become Fed chairman. Yellen's been, you know, the ghost floating around for thirty years. <laughs> oh, He's like the old bank clerk. Yeah, her seat Boop. at the FOMC table uh, is probably one of those ergonomic ones because she's been sitting in it so long that it's perfectly formed to her body. I mean, <laughs> absolutely, she she has been there forever. And she's going to wear this. It's going to be like an albatross in her back. She's going to, she's going to wear the end of the dollar standard. But why would she, you know, raise her hand up and, and say, "Yeah, I'll fall on my sword for you guys"? Why would she do that? She's a globalist. Yeah, and you got That's to understand why. power. Power yeah. corrupts because you can be. You know what? If you are so much into power and you are told, you know what, the system's going to crash around you, your ego won't accept it. You have an ego that says it doesn't matter. I can fix it. I can I can QE forever, and I can print so much money, and we will fix it because you know this is this is what a cult a cult does. 
you know, when you're programmed so much in a specific ideology, then you just can't help but believe that the ideology will always be successful. No, you're absolutely look, right. This is her her biggest thing is and this is the way it is with all the Keynesians and all the, the, the big government types. The reason these things fail isn't because we we did X, Y, and Z. It's always because we didn't do enough. Enough, exactly. And one of the things you guys got to remember with uh, with Yellen, okay, is uh, you know it, she is she's rubber stamped every single policy that Bernanke's put out, every single one. And the, that's number one. Number two, you know, she has no shame because she's been in the system for so long. And let's be honest here. You know, most of these guys that are in the Fed, that are in the system, are being fed erroneous data. That's why you could have a Yellen come forward and say, well, you know, we never saw this coming. Just like, <laughs> we never saw this market about to crash. We never we never anticipated this. None of the indicators were there. Well, indicators were there. The problem is they're not looking at the real data. They're looking at fraudulent data. They're looking at one con man uh, putting on a, a, a shy string game on another con man, and, the, 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 and then they're fed these factoids. And that's what Yellen is. She's a believer in the system. And she's so inured in the system. She's just an automaton. She's the perfect yes girl. And that's why they got her. <laughs> she's the perfect one. It's unbelievable. Marvelous, marvelous. Yeah. Uh, okay. And <laughs> now I can see it. So, so, so it's an extension. And, and you know, you mentioned Ken. You mentioned the occult. Um, I, I, look, I, I believe what we're seeing here is really evil incarnate. Of course, you know, oh, with yeah. our with our monetary system. Um, and and I, I've been told. Um, and in fact, V, you mentioned this too, where where you've seen some odd things at the. Various times, uh, you know, I, I've been told this as well uh, the, by others. Um, yeah, uh, well, I, I don't know where where to take that, but uh, I'll just pass it uh, pass it back to you, folks. Uh, Ken, go ahead. Well, I, I understand exactly what you're saying, and yeah, you know what? The if you go back to the history, pretty much all these banking families are part of the secret societies and they follow the ancient uh, Babylonian mystery uh, mystery schools. But I want to throw something out, and, and I waited to the last second. A lot of what we've talked about tonight, and we've tried our best, okay, we didn't make blanket statements saying, you know what, uh, the 2014 is a crash, and just leave it at that. We've tried to lay out indicators, 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 warning signs. Look at what, not what we're doing or saying, look at what they're doing or saying. Look at what the data is. Look at what the results are. We're trying to say the roadmap. In the end, we cannot guarantee what the what the consequences or the actions going to have. Okay, we're making uh, educated guesses based on information we have, based on opinions and information that so many others, well respected, uh, are saying outside of. The Greenspan, we didn't see it coming. Bernanke, we didn't see it coming. Yellen, we didn't see it coming. Well, if you guys three didn't see it coming, then how'd it happen type thing. Here's the thing. We can give all these estimates of where it's going, but for there's also the wild card. There's also the wild card. You know, if you take a look at uh, the book of Revelation, there's going to be a third party, a force majeure that comes onto the scene. So all of this, all of these machinations by the East and the West could be wiped out in a single day, okay? Right. Or, or one side or both could be both working their way, even if they don't realize it, towards that final final institution of that. So there's so many things at play. It's not a matter of it's not a matter of focusing on the events. What it is is focusing on internally not getting overwhelmed by it and okay realizing that there are certain probabilities that are going to happen currency is going to go away or it's going to be devalued one of the two if it's going to be go away or devalued what's my solution okay if the economy is going to crash or the stock market's going to crash 
What choices and solutions do I have? That's part of what uh, RogueMoney.net is all about. This is about why V has taken on this this uh, task of trying to help people you take their wealth, take their money, and give them advice on what is going to happen with all the potentials laid out. Because we're not omnipotent, we're not perfect, and in the end, even if we're 60 to 70% right on our assessments, that still means that 30% of the people have gotten bad information. So there's a lot of things going out there, but we try to give the road marks and the indicators and let people make the decisions and choices based on their best knowledge. Because in the end, that's really all we can do. Right. Wow. Mm. Well, you know, roguemoney.net, folks, uh, definitely bookmark that website. The, the, of course, it would be the Gorilla Economist, roguemoney.net. The link is right there off of homeonsecurityus.com. And, of course, uh, Ken Shorgren's articles, the examiner, financial examiner. Joe, you were talking about uh, every time when yeah. you would come on with Steve. We'd... Ken, we uh, are actually have been fans of yours. Um, we noticed that uh, I have a Google alert email alert and um after V would come on I, I started seeing your articles in the examiner and you know we didn't know you at the time and um I thought that it was great. I was wondering, you know, who's over there listening to our show or telling this guy about our show that he's listening and, and writing articles about it. Um and it's uh nice to have you on here and be able to talk to you because uh like I said we for months uh when V'd come on we'd be reading your articles and uh, I think I have them all saved, actually, on, on my computer. Absolutely. And, and to tell you how divinely appointed this is, Andy Sutton is kind of our neighbors, uh, our neighbor almost, uh, uh, very close by. And, of course, Mr. Sutton, uh, a professional, a, a very um, uh, extremely well-known individual in his own right. Uh, I did, and folks, certainly, uh, Sutton dash associates dot net it's hard linked off of home on security us dot com his last or his january 10th article just a fantastic article uh referencing the imf working paper penned by the harvard harvard dynamic duo ken rogoff and uh, carmen reinhardt I, it's, wow it, it just this you just can't make this stuff up um v i'm going to toss it back to you uh we we covered a lot of ground tonight and um you by the way and folks Two ninety nine a month. You, you can't beat it. Uh, Rogue money done that. But but that said, uh, V, what we've got about twenty minutes left. What do we need to do? I mean, is there anything proactive that Americans and people listening? Because we got listeners all over the world. What should the awake people be doing right now? Well, the uh, the most important thing is, is I think I think uh, between Andy and Ken and myself. Uh, we've painted a picture, and uh, irrespective of exactly how the nuances and the minutia plays out, you, there is an overarching theme. And that overarching theme is that your way of life, your dollar, your currency that you've used, and your quality of life is going to drastically change. It's not a matter of if, it's just when. And that when is, uh, is a fast-approaching bullet train and is pulling into the station very, very soon. So that's that's the guarantee right there. Now you'd have to prepare yourself, you know. And 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 I've you know thrown this out there many times. Uh, look, th there's a game here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this out there because I I was actually uh, meeting with one of my guys uh, this morning in uh, in over in White Plains, New York, uh, right outside of Manhattan, and I was uh, meeting with him because this is a gentleman who's helped me. Uh, he's helped uh, countless others who are you know who are former bankers. Um, yeah, and, and look, folks, you got to understand this. The system is rigged, okay? The, the banksters expect you to play by their rules, but they themselves don't play by those rules, okay? And one of the best things I've ever received were that I've been taught while, you know, working in the professional world was uh, break all the rules, but don't break the law, <laughs> Okay. So that being said, folks, you, you, you've got to learn how to operate outside the system. And the short time that you have, you've got to make proper preparations. You're in paper. you got, you know, X amount of money in taking the market. You've got to pull it. You've got to get into hard assets. You've got to get into precious metals. Uh, I've been using Steve Quayle to, to, in order to get uh, metals for myself as well as my clientele. 
you know, you guys can contact me at uh, at uh, GorillaEconomist at Gmail dot com. And uh, also another thing that's going to be big that I'm going to touch upon real quick before I hand it over to you guys. Um, credit. Okay, one of the things because of this economic crisis with people losing jobs and the transitions in employment, uh, the financial constraints that have happened, people have had their current uh, their credit scores absolutely ruined. Okay, and for years and decades, uh, you know, people didn't know how to how to fix their credit except you know pay their debts or do a a, a credit consolidation uh, that type of thing. Uh, but the inside secret is with our banksters. I want to I ask you guys. I'm going to tell you guys this. How do you think you have a, a bankster who was able to go into bankruptcy and then two weeks later he's out and about? And he's buying a car. He's buying himself a, a Ferrari. He buys himself a house, and his credit score goes from a 500 to a to, to a 757. I mean, how do you, how do you do that? These are some of the inside secrets. And there's one of the biggest preps you can do, especially, okay, we're seeing the rise of, of, uh, of debtors prisons, and right now it's just, it's just municipalities going after people right now for unpaid parking fines and tickets. Uh, it's only a matter of time before broke corporations try to use that same type of leverage. There's a way to protect yourself. There's a way to get your life back. And the gentleman that I was meeting uh, near the city today is someone who can help uh, if you... If you have, if you're jammed up with your credit, and uh, this is a person who's come out of the system, uh, he's helped countless others. He's helped myself when I was kicked out by one of the investment banks that I was working for because of what I knew, and I wouldn't go along with it. Uh, he's able to help you and help you get your life back. If you contact me, I'll get you a hold of him. That's one of the preps you could do. Get your credit uh, completely repaired. I'm not talking about debt consolidation. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about getting your life back and doing it very quickly, okay? Uh, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is, you know, get out of, uh, uh, again, get out of whatever debt you have. You know, try to try to take care of that. And the most important thing, uh, before I even throw it over to Andy or Ken, is, is you know, I guess, you know what, I'll, I'll save the end for the last, is the blessed hope, and I think we could all just talk about that uh, towards the end. But uh, Ken or Andy, if you guys want to add on to that, uh, feel, feel free, please. Uh, go ahead, Andy. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, I totally uh, am on board. I mean, one, one of the things that, uh, that I try to do for the clients I have here, and I, I've got uh, people of varying levels of awareness, and, and I'm hoping that everybody is, is listening to this tonight or, or will take the time. I, I sent out uh, some information to all of them, and, and I'm hoping they're hearing these things, and, and the ones that aren't quite quite there yet, I hope this gets them there hearing it from, from you other guys, too, and, and I think you did a great job uh, with that. But to trying to get people out of debt, trying to get them out of this, I have to maintain my standard of living. You're not going to be able to do it. You have to be willing to take this thing on and say, all right, what am I willing to give up now? And use whatever you're able to recoup from doing that to, to move yourself forward and do some of these other preps, like getting getting your precious metals and and doing stuff like that. But, yeah, that, that whole debt thing, it's an albatross. Uh, the debtor's prisons, I blogged about it. It's real. Yeah, it's municipal right now. It's parking tickets and that kind of thing. But I can easily see that becoming uh, something for people that don't pay mortgages or credit card debts or car payments or anything like that. So, yeah, and, and, and definitely, to whatever extent you're able to do it, get out of the paper system. And I'm in the business. And it, it's one of those things. It's, it's what we got to do. We got to get people out of it. That, that's kind of a frightening prospect. We did have there. There was a situation in our hometown. I just want to say this that um, I personally know. In fact, I'm friends with the municipal uh, district magistrate that, that did this here in Pennsylvania, um, or reportedly, allegedly did this. I'll just say that, where a mock courtroom was created by this debt collection company, and people were being served by uh, consta a constable, constables, multiple, I suppose, um, to, to enforce to appear at this mock courtroom. 
all under the color of this, this ostensibly of, of the, the color of law, which had no basis in fact whatsoever. And of course, that was a, kind of a big scandal here a couple of years ago. And it, it it posed some rough issues with me because I'm friends with this guy, and of course the the allegations were were such that um, you, you know people were were having to sell their personal assets, their their engagement rings, their wedding rings to to uh, pay the debts that were brought before this this courtroom. It was just it's incredible, but these are happening and, and yeah, fake judges, fake bailiffs, yeah. fake courtroom. Well, yeah, they, they they're were. real judges, but they're. Uh, Actually, I'm out of there. Yeah, yeah. Out of there. Now, now, let me ask this, because I, this is something I've heard about, too, and, and um, Andy, I'll ask you, uh, because we're, we're both in Pennsylvania here. Uh, I've been hearing a lot of uh, uh, debt collection companies where they will send you uh, a subpoena to appear before uh, or to appear uh, for a deposition if you owe, let's say, $5,000 to a credit card company. And it'll almost look like junk mail, so... You may discard it. You may not show up, and when you don't show up, the, the, the there's a, a bench warrant served for you. Have you heard about that? Yes, I have actually a pro bono client of mine. Uh, about this was about two years ago that had that precise thing happen. Now they didn't issue a bench warrant, but what they did is they issued a default judgment because, like you said, it came across like junk mail. Uh, the client pitched it, and there was no second notice. No, no, uh, you know service from the sheriff, you know, or a process server or anything like that. It was just, bam, here's your default judgment, uh, no recourse. Uh, now this is going to follow that individual, and, you know, they're, they've, they've been able to reestablish some cash flow now and are working towards uh, paying that down. But, yeah, that's exactly how this is going. I mean, it, it, I can easily see this being used as a lever against people to give up who knows what. Houses, cars, I'm telling you, it's the standard of living is under attack. It's been under attack. The dollar destruction over the past hundred years has been the kind of the, the you know the tip of the spear of that. But now they're using rule of law. The government is nothing more than an enforcement arm for this whole corrupt system. Incredible. Yeah. And we see the, the building of those police forces and, and federal police forces, every agency, even the Federal Reserve is, is growing their armed police units and uh, the IRS implementation, the, the affordable health care rollout, the enforcement branch. And, and we see this, there was this 15,000 or 16,000 new IRS agents, the buildup of the ammunition, uh, the paramilitary gear being shared with local municipalities from uh, coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq. Then this is what we're going to be facing, uh, and they'll be protecting these government institutions. They'll be protecting the Federal Reserves. They'll be protecting, you know, the IRS buildings. Uh, they won't be protecting you or or helping the average everyday American. Absolutely. Right, and you, the one thing you got to remember too, okay, and I, from my historical background, you realize there's nothing new under the sun. Imagine the people in the dark ages after the Roman Empire fell, where the the, the average lifespan was about uh, 25 to 30 years old. You had expected that one or two of your children would be would die before you, you know, uh, before you died or you'd have one or two parents. You were afraid to ever leave your village because the forest was so dark and there were so many fears and threats. Okay, and you had ra ravaging... Um, bands of uh, like the no, the the Vandals and the Goths and the Visigoths, all vying for control. Okay, this is the thing that you you know it's not as barbaric today as it was then, but the point being is that there for the very very uh, majority of people, you are the we are the peasants per se, and then there is the empire, and then there are those who are outside the empire trying to tear down the empire. You know, China and Russia are trying to take down the U.S., and the U.S. is trying to control the masses. It's it's just it's the same thing in a different point of view. But the point is is that when the empire fell, the Roman uh, government, the Roman soldiers did not ever bother to think about the people. The people were on their own. And that's, wh that's pretty much what we're at this point. So if... If you try to think about what can I do, what, what you know, how are we going to do this? Worrying about the government, worrying about 
what the government's going to do, what the what the economy's going to do. You've got to look in your own house. And this is, I think, what V was alluding to as we get towards the end. There are several different options, but it all depends on what your spirit, spiritual level is. Okay? If we speak on the things, you know, what's that scripture say? Preaching the things of the kingdom to them that perish is foolishness. Yes. Okay, the the real truth of the matter is, is if we give, adv- you know, advice, spiritual advice to non-Christians, then it's going to go over their heads and be meaningless. If we give it to the to uh, luke, lukewarm the church, Christianity as it is today, it's going to go over their heads. But if we give it to spirit-filled people whose trust and reliance, no matter what, is on God and on the power of God and the manifestation, then it's going to be then it's going to work. So there, in many cases, the advice that we give or the or the views have to be tempered on who our audience is. Am I speaking to a secular on financial things? Am I speaking to a Christian who believes in the unscriptural thing? God helps those who help themselves. That's old. That's Old Testament. You know, that's Old Testament. That's not New Covenant. Am I speaking to a spirit-filled person in the kingdom who realizes that? Uh, if you have the trust of a mustard seed and do not doubt, then you can move mountains and nothing is impossible. So if you're thinking in that aspect, then uh, if I don't have any food, I can manifest it just like Jesus did. If I have bad water, I can turn it to good water just as Jesus did, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have to worry about stockpiling things. I have the power that created the universe within me that I can do this. If I'm talking to somebody who's uh, a Christian in the churchianity, well, yeah, they're going to want to, prep and they're going to want to supply themselves and they're going to want to figure out how to you know the patriot movement type thing or if you have the seculars who don't really believe in the spiritual aspect of what is happening they're going to say okay just give me good financial advice I'll take it and I'll move on you see what I'm saying there Doug and Joe there's not Absolutely. a one size fits all when it gives when when we're speaking and trying to give advice on on what's happening or what the best course of action to take from each of these things is very well put. Yeah, and people um, really need to. I mean, as much as the show is about money, we need to uh, understand that there is going to come a time where things are going to. I mean, we see the writing on the wall. We see how bad things are getting, and we do need to uh, rely on the Lord more than we do anything else. And if we don't, I guarantee uh, each and every one of us who don't will go through something that will change that in our lives. Absolutely. And, uh, it won't be pretty going through it that way, but and, and just for the listeners tonight, I want to invite you to our special Sunday edition this Sunday with uh, Pastor David Langford and Steve Quayle. We're going to be talking about this. We're kind of an extension of this uh, tonight, so it's going to be great. But uh, go ahead, V. Didn't uh, mean to to interrupt. That. You know, people uh, people are probably always wondering, and uh, Andy gets this, Ken gets it, and uh, you know, I, I get it all the time as well. How can you guys read all this bad news and uh, still keep sane? And the answer is quite simple. Uh, you know, we had Christ who said, when you see these things come to be, re- lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. You know, a long time ago, folks, all three of us guys, we've decided to store up treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust can, uh, can, can corrupt nor thief can even break in. And that's our blessed hope. You know, you can't build a life and get through this uh, this, this coming turmoil without a faith in Christ. And I don't look, and this is coming from me who was a former atheist. And I realized that there is a God because I've seen the godlessness in men. And I've seen the devil worshiping firsthand uh, with my prior and previous employers. It's real. And the struggle is real. And you have to be spiritually um, uh, functioning and spiritually filled in order to survive what is to come. Well, that's that you have nothing. You know, one of the highlights, if you're going to take anything away from this, okay, we've, we've shattered a lot of paradigms tonight. And one of the things that Andy and Ken and myself want to give to all you folks is this. Jesus Christ is the ultimate prep. He is the prep. And if you're not prepped in him, you got nothing. You could have 10 years' worth of food. You could have uh, 10 million rounds of ammunition. But unless you have Christ... Brother, you got nothing. 
You have absolutely nothing. You have no strategy. You're going to be gripped by fear, and you won't even know what to do. You're going to be gripped by confusion, and you won't know what to do. And your Ken, if you guys want to add anything to that. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to throw something in there. and We know who the author of confusion is, and no. we know that God's given us not the spirit of fear, but that of a sound mind. And I, you kind of you kind of took away a little bit about what I wanted to say there. <laughs> but I, I, Sorry, brother. I've, I've got to, I've, that's all right. I've got to agree 100%. If you are one of those people, you're out there listening tonight or you listen sometime down the road and you're thinking about all this from a, uh, from a temporal standpoint, from, a, from an earthly standpoint, you've got to stop. You've got to look at yourself. You've got to look at your life. You got to look at who you are before a holy God. You got to humble yourself before Him, Amen. and you got to accept what His Son did for you. And when you do that, your fears will go away. You will not be afraid. You will not feel like the world is ending in panic and all this other stuff that you see so many people having to deal with now. You will have true peace. Really, even in even in this time of total chaos, you can have true peace because you know when this is all over, no matter how it shakes down, you know, the Bible says everyone will believe, every head will bow. And you know what? The guys that the guys that don't want to do it now, they will eventually. I would That's encourage right. strongly anybody who's not there to really if you think Forget about the last three hours. This is the most important decision and the most important thing you could ever do for yourself. And for, it's because it's for all eternity. It's it, that's what it's, it's what it's all about. It's not for five years. It's not for 2014. It's forever. Amen. Amen. Indeed. Wow. And folks, I hope you can appreciate what these men just said in the last few minutes of the last segment of the show. That's what it's all about. And it's, you know, tough guys like to uh, uh, perhaps uh, think that we can do this on our own. We can't do it on our own, and nor should we. So uh, truly, men of God. Nor do we have to. Well, that's right. That's exactly. Exactly. Wow. Well, uh, V uh, and, and Ken and Andy, I'll tell you what, it's been a very informative three hours. I I just cannot thank you folks enough for taking your time out on a Friday evening. I'm sure you had numerous other things that you could be doing, but you spent it with us. Thank you for that. And uh, our audience thanks you. We're getting very inundated with emails here about your, your appearance. And, of course, um, uh, vroguemoney.net. Uh, Ken, well, just go to HomelandSecurityUS.com, the, the top story right there. It'll link you to all of the websites. Um, a couple minutes left. Uh, v, go ahead. Uh, take us out as you believe that we should. Any final thoughts, sir? Yeah, uh, just want to thank uh, uh, these guys for coming on. And these guys are my brothers in arms. And uh, it's been such a joy and a pleasure. You know, every single, every single time I come on, I always say to myself, hey, Matt, the, that's the best show I've ever done. And uh, tonight was so special because it's like you had three fantastic economic minds, and we gave it to you guys, and we, we laid it all on the field tonight. And I hope, I hope and I, I know for a fact that that's what people are going to take out of this. Um, you know, uh, you guys could, uh, you know, reach us at, uh, all three of us are on Rogue Money. I mean, I see Rogue Money as a hub for, for, uh, for, for all of us. We all kind of hang out there and, you know, Andy's there and, and, and Ken's there and I'm there. And, you know, we also got this guy named John L. He's there as well. And so it's a, it's a growing thing. And, you know, anybody needs help, uh, reach out to me, Gorilla Economist, uh, at gmail.com. If you need your credit fixed, again, folks, you got, uh, 20, uh, 30, 2014 is the last year to do it. Because uh, 2015, all three credit bureaus are going away. You're going to have only one credit bureau. This gets us set up for the debtor's prisons and things of that sort. If you want to get that fixed, there's info.topcreditpros123 uh, at gmail.com, or you can contact me. I'll get you in a hold with uh, with these guys. I can fix you guys up. Uh, they're believers as well. Uh, let's, let, let's make this year count. Let's make this year special. Uh, that's all I've got to say, and God bless you all. Gentlemen, thank you so very much for spending your time. Fantastic tonight. Well, that'll do it, folks. 
for this edition of the Hagman Hagman Report. I want to thank, oh, again, all three gentlemen, Andy Sutton, Ken Short, Shorgen, and also, excuse me, uh, via the Gorilla Economist. Lost my, lost my uh, voice there for a second. Thank you, uh, gentlemen, for coming on tonight. That'll do it for tonight. Uh, tomorrow night we're going to be on Braveheart Radio at 7 o'clock. We'll put something up on the website, and of course on Sunday we will be uh, having a special pro- program here. <clears throat> Excuse me, a special program here with Steve Quayle and Pastor David Langford. Definitely tune into this. Yeah. Tune into that Sunday night. Yeah, and it was a great show tonight, gentlemen. And V, uh, it's been a while, and I'm glad to have you back on here. And uh, Ken and Andy, you guys are always welcome to come back on. Uh, our, from what the chat is saying, they really enjoyed the show and, and uh, got a lot out of it. So we we really appreciate your time and uh, the contributions you made on the air tonight. It's been uh, a great show. It went really fast. Uh, I don't know if it went fast for you guys, but it did for us, and uh, we really appreciate it. It did. Hey, it was a pleasure being here. I appreciate you guys uh, having me on, and uh, like I said, it's an honor, and it was just great being here and having a chance to share some time with you guys. So, yeah, the pleasure is all all here. Yeah, amen. Amen. A lot of fun. <laughs> All right. If you can't if you well, can't have fun staring a crisis in the face, you know what? You're on the wrong planet. <laughs> and, and, and we stare at 24/7 right in the face. Absolutely. Well, gentlemen, good night. And again, thank you so much for your time, folks. That'll do it. Until Sunday. God bless. <laughs>